Good evening and welcome to our 2021 Race for the Mayor Candidates Forum. I'm David Jones, President and CEO of the Community Service Society. I want to thank our co-sponsors for tonight's forum, Make the Road, New York, Community Voices Heard, and of course, City and State, one of the top news sites for politics and politics. CSS has been around for a long time, uh, more than 175 years. What sets us apart is our ability to bring a combination of rigorous, credible research, advocacy know-how, effective communication, and perhaps most of all, partnerships with community-based groups to advance ideas and initiatives that promote economic mobility for low-income families here in New York. To inform our work, we survey low-income opinions through our annual Unheard Third Poll, the only survey of its kind in the country. Healthcare, the subject of tonight's forum, is an area of intense focus for CSS. Our health assistance program and partnership with CBOs all over New York State serve more than 130,000 New Yorkers annually. And our health policy and advocacy work has led to important policy achievements, including the launch of the state's essential plan, extending free or low cost health insurance to hundreds of thousands of New Yorkers and reforms to funding for safety nut hospitals, particularly HHC. I also wanted to note that CSS is producing a voter's guide to help educate New Yorkers on the candidates' positions on critical issues impacting our city. Before I turn the program over to our co-sponsors, I wanted to recognize the candidates who have joined us this evening for this critical discussion. Tonight's forum is broken into two sessions. For session one, we have Carlos Manchaca, Diane Morales, Scott Stringer, Lori Sutton, and Maya Wiley. For session two, it will be Eric Adams, Sean Donovan, Catherine Garcia, Zach Iskol, Raymond McGuire, and Andrew Yang. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Theo O'Shara, Deputy Director of Make the Road New York. Theo, it's to you. at Make the Road New York. I'd like to start by noting that we have interpretation services available tonight. The language justice is about everyone's right to communicate in the language or language variety in which they feel most comfortable. And with that in mind, the organizers of today's event have made a strong commitment to creating a bilingual space by providing the audience with interpretation into Spanish. Interpreters will use non-binary and gender inclusive language and we thank our interpreters tonight. La justicia del lenguaje consiste en el derecho de todos a comunicarse en el idioma o variante de un idioma en el que se sientan más cómodos. Con ese fin, los organizadores del evento de hoy han tenido la firme determinación de crear un espacio bilingüe al poner a disposición del público interpretación al español. Los intérpretes usarán lenguaje no binario e inclusivo de género. Si llama el número que ve en su pantalla, podrá oír este foro en español. Y gracias a nuestros intérpretes. It is my pleasure to stand alongside the Community Service Society and Community Voices Heard tonight to hear from our city's mayoral candidates on their vision for health care and health justice. Make the Road and our members have just gone through four years of fear, tragedy, and loss. And our members have felt so much pain on so many fronts from draconian immigration enforcement policies to lack of adequate and affordable housing, from rampant income inequality to discrimination, to discrimination and violence against transgender communities. And on top of all of this, our communities continue to be ravaged by COVID-19. At our community center in Jackson Heights, Queens, one of the major epicenters in the whole country, we have lost 86 community members to COVID with countless more infected, suffering long lasting health effects, unable to put food on the table, and afford the most basic necessities. 
all because our elected officials have so far decided that legal status makes them undeserving of the most basic human needs like health insurance and income replacements for essential workers. It is clear that COVID has had disparate impacts on low-income communities of color in our city, but it is also clear that it has been years of structural inequalities that have worsened these disparities. Simply said, years of making the wrong health policy decisions have led us to this awful moment where the lives of so many people of color have been destroyed. One of the candidates uh, tonight well, will become our city's most powerful person with the power to shift the reality for our city's most in need. And the entire country will be looking to our next mayor to see how a city can respond during and after this pandemic in a way that creates real structural change. Our next leader can seize this opportunity to change course and move closer to health justice for our city's hardest hit. And we are excited to hear your visions today. With that, I'd like to introduce an esteemed colleague who I've had the pleasure of working alongside on many fronts on our fight for justice. Executive Director of Community Voices Heard, Afia Atamensa. Thank you, Theo. Good evening, everyone. My name is Afia Atamensa, and I serve as the Executive Director of Community Voices Heard. Community Voices Heard is a 26-year-old member-led base building institution principally comprised of women of color and low-income families across New York State. We proudly build power at these communities to tackle issues like creating and preserving truly affordable housing, strengthening the social safety net, reimagining public safety, immigrant justice, transportation equity, and more. Our membership is so happy to be joined with our comrades and dear colleagues in the struggle at CSS and Make the Road to York. Uh, to hear firsthand how these mayoral hopefuls seek to tackle issues of health care and inequality in all aspects of the access to and treatment of Black communities and communities of color. We are calling on the next mayor to center in policy and action, not just in speeches, Black communities and communities of color for investment in the vital systems such as health care that will allow our people to thrive. So many of our membership have stories of seeking health care only be turned away, unheard and dismissed. And sadly, when they return, it is with a more serious issue that requires emergency care. As a black woman, I'm quite familiar with this treatment by healthcare personnel who do not believe black women. Sadly, their disbelief far too often leads to our death. And while we've her heralded the sheroes and heroes who work in hospitals, nursing homes and care centers, the budgets of safety net hospitals are being threatened with cuts right now in the midst of a global pandemic. Vaccine dispatched across this great city has undergone some noticeable hiccups, and many of us are waiting with bated breath for the next shoe to drop. So we are eager for a robust conversation this evening so we may get a sense of your plans and visions to help heal our ailing city. And in that vein, I wanna introduce our esteemed moderator, Cheryl Huggins Solomon. Ms. Solomon is Chief Communications Officer and Senior Research Scientist for NYU McSilver's Institute for Poverty, Policy, and Research. She is also a regular contributor to Everyday Health, Inc., a former managing editor at TheRoot.com, and previously served as an adjunct lecturer on journalism at York College. Tonight, she will help guide our conversation on healthcare, equity, and the future of New York City. Thank you so much. So excited uh, to hear Cheryl take us forward. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the 2021 Race for the Mayor, addressing equity in healthcare during COVID-19 and beyond. This forum will focus on how the next mayor will address inequities in our healthcare system, issues of affordability, access to quality care, and equal treatment in services across the system that existed before the COVID-19 pandemic, but which have been laid bare by the virus. Now this evening's session will be bro broken up actually into two sessions. And I'd like to uh, give a programming note here then Mr. Isco will not be participating in the mayoral forum this evening. Uh, Politico is reporting that he is dropping out of the mayor's race, and so he won't be participating. But with that right now, I'd like to introduce this evening's session one candidates in alphabetical order, 
and then lay out a few rules of the road. I'm going to be very brief in my introductions. Uh, and as well, there will be no opening statements. We want to jump right into the discussion. But before we do that, first, I'd like to introduce Carlos Menchaca, who was elected in 2014 to represent Brooklyn's 38th district as a member of the New York City Council. Diane Morales, who is the former CEO of Phipps Neighborhoods, a Bronx-based nonprofit that serves children, youth, and families in low-income communities. Pat Stringer, who was elected city controller in 2013, he previously served as a state assembly member and Manhattan borough president. Lori Sutton is a retired army brigadier general and served as commissioner of the city department of veteran services in the de Blasio administration. Maya Wiley is a civil rights activist who served as board chair of the New York City Civilian Complaint Review Board and is former counsel to Mayor de Blasio. So with that, we have our candidates, but let me explain. Uh, the questions I will be asking have been prepared by the forum sponsors and are informed in part by Community Service Society's annual Unheard Third Survey of Low Income New Yorkers. Uh, which I hope you all will check out. The candidates have not seen the questions in advance. And each candidate will have one minute to respond to questions. That's one minute. This time limit will also apply to follow-up questions. And if candidates exceed the time limit, I will let them know with a respectful thank you. After which we will promptly move on to the next candidate or question. At the end of our questions, time permitting, um, we'll have half a minute for each candidate to make a closing statement. I hope we can get to that, um, but we'll see how the conversation goes. Also, because time is limited, we respectfully ask that candidates replies focus on their own plans for the city and not on what their opponents are doing. And for the same reason, um, I'm going to um, ask everyone questions in turn in a predetermined order. And we ask that candidates uh, not speak out of turn is I will make sure that I call on everyone. But I know this is gonna be a great conversation. We have a full slate of questions and a tight window so the other thing is we're not taking questions from the audience, but what we will do is we are monitoring audience comments and we're going to highlight them at various points of the forum on the virtual banner. With that, let us begin. So this first question is about increasing COVID-19 vaccinations in communities of color. Community Service Society issued a report today that found that 36% of Latinx and 31% of Black New Yorkers said that they or a family member had COVID-19. This was versus 20% of white people. As of this week, however, New York City has vaccinated just 5% of the population. So my first question, what would you do to ramp up vaccine distribution in New York City? And how would you prioritize distribution to communities of color over other groups? Or rather, would you prioritize them in that way? And if so, how would you do that? Um, first up, I'm going to ask Mr. Menchaca. Thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting us. And my name is Carlos Menchaca. I'm running for mayor. And this question is really important for us to think about. COVID impacted communities include immigrant, public housing, people of color communities. The one thing that has been uh, a barrier is language access. One of the things that we need to do is to ensure that all the languages are included as we bring good information, solid information, dispelling all the myths. Two, we need to bring massive amounts of vaccines in places like open stadiums. I think that one of the things that is important is that we bring more, more vaccines out to people. The last thing I think is really, really important is that we work with trusted community partners, Make the Road um, and others have incredible health programs that have already built solid relationships. As the task force co-chair of the census in the city council, we learned so much from the census program that we can reactivate to ensure that we rebuild uh, infrastructure that is already warm to include good information from Motoras and others to bring vaccines. Thank you. 
Thank you. Now I'm going to ask the same question of Diane Morales. Thank you. Um, so, you know, I, I think I really appreciate the, um, the opportunity to answer this question, and I appreciate the framing of health, the health of our communities as being intersectional and being connected to so many other social determinants of health and so many other um, social inequities that actually exist. And it's not surprising that the vaccination rates are actually reflective of that. I think one of the things we have to recognize is that our communities lack trust in the institutions that are supposed to be charged with caring for us. So I think that in addition to um, some of what Carlos mentioned in terms of the need for us to provide education and information in a linguistically and culturally appropriate way, we also need to engage our credible messengers from the community, not only to provide us information, but also in the distribu dis distribution and dissemination of the vaccine. And that includes accessing seniors in their homes, mobilizing our faith-based community and local community organiza organizations to support the dissemination, and really making sure that our essential workers are at the forefront and that this information is getting to our low-income people of color communities so that we can actually provide them with the support that they have in turn provided us throughout the course of this last year. Um, let me ask you a quick follow-up question to that. Uh, as a former um, uh, nonprofit uh, uh, executive, sure. um, how would you, how does the city, or how do cities get it wrong in working with nonprofit and, and community-based organizations in these efforts? How much time do I have? No. <laughs> <laughs> One minute. Uh, um, so, you know, I, I think that uh, one of the things in this particular administration that's been done terribly wrong is the lack of trust in the, in the community-based organizations and the lack of actually letting community-based organizations lead. We are much closer to the problems, much closer to the community, much closer to the, the, the solution. And I think that one of the things that has been sorely missing is the, the real true partnership and engagement of community-based organizations and sort of following the advice and the recommendations. We, you know, we have the community's trust. They have come to us for the last 12 months for food when the city has failed um, and all sorts of other supports when the city has failed. We have those relationships. We could actually make a difference and make this happen. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. And now I would like to go back and ask uh, General Sutton um, the question about vaccine distribution. Sure. Well, I think, uh, first of all, thanks for having me this evening. I think many of the important points have been raised, and I would just reinforce a couple of, of them. One, I think this is an all-of-the-above strategy that uh, the city needs to look not only to the community-based organizations, the credible messengers, the houses of worship, the faith communities, uh, the senior centers, but also the private sector. And I think this is where uh, individuals, particularly the, the essential workers, many of whom, as we know, are immigrants, are people of color, they have to, they have, to have the trust that this is the right thing to do, and then they have to have the access of being able to actually access uh, the vaccination. And I will tell you, having worked with uh, numerous folks over these last several weeks trying to get appointments to vaccinations. It seems like it's just starting to break open this week, which is a good thing, but it's been an absolute disaster. And so I think that, uh, you know, the kinds of issues with trust that Diane mentioned and that Carlos has mentioned as well is absolutely critical to move forward. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Stringer. Look, we didn't know when the virus arrived, but we knew that the vaccine was coming. And the fact that this administration did not plan for mass distribution is so outrageous to me. It, it's just terrible. Look, as controller, I told the administration, let's get going. We need 24 seven sites. We need to redirect contact tracers into communities of color and neighborhoods where we have language barrier and language access issues. And we need to do that now. I offered a plan called Fair Shot NYC, demanding that employers give employees paid time off to get that vaccine. And we need data. We need data on race. We need data on zip code. And we need to have a system that breaks down this bureaucracy. Look, the longer we take to vaccinate, we can't open the economy. The longer we take to vaccinate, our parents and grandparents and people with pre-existing health conditions are in danger. I get calls every morning 
not from people over 75. I get calls from people who are in their 40s and 50s saying to me, I can't make an appointment on the website. There's three separate websites. They're crashing. I can't get my parents and Thank you, but I actually have a follow-up question uh, for you, Mr. Stringer. Um, with that, I mean, you, you talk about um, streamlining vaccine administration. Uh, who would you charge with doing that? And can you provide just a few details? Yes. Uh, look, in this administration, we have sidelined the Department of Health. Uh, all the responsibility rests with H and H. They are overwhelmed. I would put DOH in the front seat of this, but ultimately it's the mayor and it's city hall. And you got to be able to manage a two car funeral. And that is what has plagued the administration, why I'm running for mayor, because I have a progressive agenda for the city, but I also got the skills to manage. And that's what we need right now, because we've got to get people inoculated before more people die. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Wiley. Do we still have Ms. Wiley? Okay, so it looks like um, while we get Ms. Wiley back, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go on to the next question, but I will give her a chance to answer the first question when she comes back. So this next question is on immigrants' access to health insurance. Federal and state policies limit eligibility and discourage access to health programs available to citizens and lawful residents, which result in higher uninsured rates among immigrants. So the question is, as mayor, what types of programs and policies would you champion to maximize enrollment of immigrants and quality co insurance coverage that they can also afford? With that, my first um, we'll pose this to Ms. Morales. Awesome, thank you. Uh, so I guess my first you know, response to that is that we need to be able to provide guaranteed health care to everyone that is not contingent on health insurance. We need a system that works for all, regardless of immigration status, of income, or pre-existing conditions. Um, I, you know, right now there are over 500,000 immigrants in New York City who are currently excluded from public health insurance. And that is highly problematic because we know that immigrants have contributed to the success and ongoing operation of the city throughout the height of this crisis. And part of doing that, part of making healthcare accessible and available to them also means getting ICE out of our healthcare system. It erodes trust with our immigrant communities and goes back to my original point about the need for us to build trust in the communities that we need to serve and, and be serve as caretakers for. And that means separating those systems and actually protecting our immigrants by providing them with health care. Thank you. And I'd actually like to uh, ask a follow up question. Um, you mentioned it sounds like um, alternatives to the way that we um, offer health insurance now to make sure that they're covered. Could you provide a few more details of what those alternatives would be? I mean, sim simply, st simply stated, I, I really believe that we should be providing healthcare to everyone, that we should have guaranteed healthcare for everyone in New York, and that we need to do whatever we need to do with the state, uh, our city budget in order to make that possible. Um, the, the structural disparities in access to healthcare are, are highly problematic. And we know that, the, that it results in a disproportionate impact on black and brown communities. And so I think we need to do everything that we can to, to make sure that we provide coverage for everybody. Thank you, thank you. I will now ask the same question to General Sutton. Thank you. Yeah, I think this issue of healthcare, the pandemic has laid bare just how inadequate employer-based healthcare is. I think going forward that what we really need to do is we need to develop a much more robust network of community, uh, primary health care hubs, places where people can easily access uh, regardless of their citizenship uh, status. And in fact, I've said it before, I'll say it again, any undocumented immigrant who has served on the front lines during this pandemic ought to have a absolute first uh, row um, uh, pathway to, to become a citizen. That's the kind of New Yorker we need. And I think that we need to absolutely invest in public health because we've also learned that there is no health without public health. And there's a lot to do to be able to marry those systems together so that they work 
much more effectively and we're never in this situation again. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Stringer. Look, no one on this call tonight is surprised by the outcomes we have seen with COVID. Uh, not when we live uh, with two healthcare systems. One healthcare system for the wealthy and private hospitals and everyone gets leftovers. We must make insurance more affordable. We have to ensure universal coverage in our city regardless of immigration or documentation status. I do think the Biden administration is gonna help, but as mayor, you gotta be proactive. You gotta invest in H&H. &H. We should have the goal that no New Yorker should have to travel more than 20 minutes from their home to see a doctor that is critical. I wanna expand, radically expand NYC Cares so that undocumented people have access to good preventative care. I do wanna ramp up Metro Plus. That's the city's managed Medicaid plan and make sure those dollars are flowing back to H&H. &H. But also at the same time, we have to ramp up uh, our healthcare system, incentivize doctors to come to our immigrant communities by forgiving student loans and other debts. We have to create a pool of doctors and nurses that are gonna to wanna to do this work. And Thank also- you. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry, I, uh, we have limited time, but I would love to move on to um, Ms. Wiley. Thank you, and I apologize. I was having tech issues and I had to log off and get, get back on. So I okay. don't know what the question is. That's all right. Um, we're gonna back up for a second. And I just wanna ask you, uh, what would you do to ramp up vaccine uh, distribution in New York City? And would you prior prioritize distribution to communities of color and low-income communities? Yeah, let's just start with the fact that communities that have experienced 73 to 88% of the death due to COVID should be vaccinated and seen as priorities for vaccination. It's just math, as well as humanitarian and recognizing who's at the greatest risk. And unfortunately, one of the reasons it's communities of color is also because we have had not just pre-existing conditions, it's that we've had inadequate services, equipment, and staffing in facilities in communities of color. So in some instances, inadequate equipment to save lives that otherwise could have been saved. So we absolutely also have to invest in the infrastructure, the services and the staffing along with vaccinations because as we roll it out and as people continue to get sick, which we should be preventing, we have to make sure communities of color are getting the healthcare they deserve because it's a human right. Thank you. Uh, I'm also going to catch you up by asking you the next question, um, which is about immigrants' access to health care. Um, and um, what types of programs and policies would you champion to maximize enrollment of immigrants and quality insurance coverage that they can afford? Uh, and, and in your answer, if you can talk a little bit as well, because you have mentioned um, before the way that the city can, you know, negotiate or use its purchasing power, its leverage. Um, if you can talk about that a little bit, please. Yeah, so first of all, healthcare is a human right. Uh, and as someone who as a civil rights lawyer and advocate sued to keep maternal and childcare beds in Harlem, knows about hospital closures and also has lobbied on healthcare reform in Congress and the Clinton administration for social justice for healthcare. I will tell you that what we have to do right now as a city is understand that the city has substantial bargaining power. We have 600,000 people who are uninsured. Many of them are undocumented immigrants. Also people who are in a cash economy who have papers. So the issue is how the city says, we're gonna partner with our, 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 our public unions, um, our not-for-profit institutions, create the kind of bargaining power that brings costs down, create transparency in the system because we have hospitals that are gouging right now in some instances, because they're charging higher prices for certain services for some and lower for others. We have to stop that because it's a way we can create more affordability. But I am looking into and talking with experts around how we create insurance Thank you. for Thank people. You. Who I, I will get to the question uh, about hospitals. Um, that is coming up. So um, you will have more time to address that. Um, but um, now I must move on to the next question. Um, oh, wait a minute. Uh, is there I'm a sorry. Way that, uh, Mr. Menchaca. <laughs> yeah. I don't mean to skip you. 
Oh, that's okay. That's okay. Um, thank you so much. So my plans are really rooted in a lot of what community organizations have brought to us. One, we have been funding for a while. We need to expand funding for lawyers to ensure that those who are actually eligible get insured. Once people are insured, we get we get them stabilized into the healthcare system. That's been an incredible project out of the city council. Two, uh, we have an incredible uh, another initiative to fully fund the community health advocates program. Uh, this allows for one-on-one -on -one engagement with immigrants to understand the system and put them through uh, an incredible um, access point. Uh, three, adult literacy programs actually allow for immigrants to engage in the healthcare system like nothing before. And that's something that the city council has been championing. Uh, next, we have an incredible uh, opportunity here with the state to bring the supermajority in line with the things that we need here in the city. So there are bills in the Senate um, that we can pass and in the assembly that can ensure immigrant health care access. Gottfried and Rivera have a bill that can bring uh, a state funded essential plan for all New Yorkers. Um, those are the kind of things that we can do and Make the Road has an incredible plan uh, that I will be championing. Thank you. I had to go on mute for a second. There are sirens outside of my window. I live near a hospital. So um, this actually um, uh, will relate to one of our upcoming questions, but I guess my next one has to do with um, healthcare infrastructure, actually. So, um, look, the COVID-19 pandemic is illuminating the devastating toll that has that unequal distribution of healthcare infrastructure has had on our city's communities of color and in the outer boroughs. Um, in 2020, Manhattan had 6.4 hospital beds for every 1,000 residents, while Queens had only 1.5 hospital beds for every 1,000 residents. Um, similar disparities exist in the Bronx and in Brooklyn. So communities have heard a lot of lip service from policymakers about addressing healthcare system inequities. Uh, what would you do as mayor to ensure that this healthcare infrastructure is distributed more equitably? And my first uh, first up, General Sutton. Thank you so much. Well, I think a good place to start is with the data, as you said, that highlights the disparities. But then I would also want to take a second and third order look at that data to see what the disparities or what the relevant um, data would suggest in terms of access to trauma, level one trauma centers, as well as uh, um, primary care centers. I mean, I think there's a whole systems approach that has to go on when it comes to healthcare infrastructure and access. So I think that's the first place I'd start. I'd also say in terms of, as a subset of healthcare, mental health care, very concerning when you see all of the seriously mentally ill, untreated uh, individuals, New Yorkers who are putting themselves at risk as well as others at risk. And over these last several years, the hospital beds, the long-term treatment care for the mentally ill have gone way down while we've got more and more folks, both the decarcerated individuals from Rikers, as well as just the wear and tear of the pandemic over these last 12 months. And there has to be a very serious reckoning to bring those things back together and make sure that we've got the right infrastructure and access to quality health care for everyone. Um, let me ask you a follow-up. If you could provide a few more details um, specifically in terms of uh, mental health care, um, who would you charge with doing that and um, how can we make this better? Sure. I think in terms of mental health care, we need to understand that this is linked to homelessness. It's linked to the criminal legal system and part of what my uh, 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 focus would be going forward would be to put the justice back in the criminal legal system, but we need to understand that it's not just a single issue that can be dealt with separately. So what I would look to do as a systems plan would be to both um, bring the clubhouse system, the fountain house system to scale across the city, proven system. If you haven't visited, you need to go visit the uh, their program. I would also double down on the secure diversion programs of keep the mentally ill out of the prisons. I'd also double down on the staffing at the shelters and in the ER so that we can 
intervene early and make sure that we've got social workers who are working with the police when it comes to emotionally disturbed person's calls and we make sure that our mentally ill individuals are not just trying to survive on the subway or on the sidewalk Thank you. get the care that they need. Thank, Thank you. And um, so uh, I would ask the same question about healthcare infrastructure um, of Mr. Stringer. Well, let me, let me nod to Carlos and Laurie. They've identified, I think, critical programs that could actually help invest in communities. But I think a broader question that I think the next mayor has to answer is, are we going to take a sledgehammer to the status quo or we're simply gonna manage people's illnesses? When my mom died of COVID uh, in a Bronx hospital in April, the doctor there said to me, this is not just a disease that impacts older people with pre-existing health conditions as my mom certainly had. He talked about the Bronx and talked about people of color, black people, and Latino people in their 40s and 50s were dying because they suffered from diabetes and, and pre-existing health conditions, asthma, and a whole host of issues. And when you overlay what was happening in the Bronx, you saw the dirty bus depot stations and the bad decisions government made uh, to build things that ended up polluting the local neighborhoods and everybody knows it. So we need to redesign a healthcare system that does two things. One, we have to do the prevention work and solve these health disparities. That means programs, but it also means we've got to get the Department of Health back in the game. We got to merge H and H and DOMH so that they are proactively looking at ways to prevent the next virus or the next healthcare crisis. And that means we also have to not just invest in hospital or local clinic infrastructure, but we have to invest in personnel, the nurses, the doctors. Thank How you. are we going to grow that that healthcare in the communities? And that's how we will end those disparities. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ms. Wiley. Hi, do we have Ms. Wiley? Apologies, I didn't realize I was muted. Uh, <laughs> one of the things we have to address, experience uh, bias in the healthcare system, it costs lives, frankly. I mean, Rana Mungin in Brooklyn, who was a middle school teacher, 30 years old, was turned away from testing two times, uh, got so sick and ultimately died of COVID at the age of 30. And that was not just about whether there was a hospital present, it was how she was treated when she got there. And so it's critically important that when we talk about healthcare infrastructure, we recognize it is preventive care. So we've got community health clinics that are part of the front line of primary care in a lot of communities of color that don't have adequate services and they serve as important services. They're at risk of closure right now because they stepped up in COVID and they stepped up without getting support. And that's about a hundred million dollars. I will have a moral budget and that moral budget will ensure that those community centers, health centers stay open because we have to preserve that infrastructure. We have to save our independent hospitals, they're at risk of closure, who are, are not sitting on billions of dollars of endowments the way some of the other uh, systems are, who did not frankly take on the care and fill the beds that they had with patients. So we will do that. Thank you. Mr. Menchaca. Thank you. We have to bring healthcare to the people. And part of what I want to do is bring infrastructure into schools and really build out community schools in a way that allows for not just a nurse, but a larger healthcare access point for young people and their parents. Second, I think that what's really important is that we learn from COVID and what's happened in COVID. So many times people were not able to know whether or not they needed to go to the emergency room. Working with the Red Hook Initiative uh, in Red Hook, and local volunteers, we actually built out a system that brought telemedicine, actual doctors, working with the Department of Health and other volunteer doctors to people. And telemedicine works. I think we need to bring that kind of infrastructure to people so we can get a primary care relationship when we can't bring fast enough physical infrastructure. Thank you. I want to ask you a follow-up about that. Um, 
So what are some best practices with uh, telemedicine that happened in Red Hook through the um, Red Hook initiative that um, you think are scalable and how would they be scalable? Absolutely. So there are two things that are really important about what we learned. One mm -hmm. is that the actual caller needed to be coming from a trusted source. Red Hook Initiative and the council member's office, my office, uh, were critical to getting the door open, literally through the phone and saying, hey, second, we spoke the languages. English, Spanish, and Mandarin were the spoken language of our volunteers. Third, when we brought people who didn't know when they needed to activate, uh, there was, and these are now more plentiful, uh, abilities for volunteers to kind of go through uh, questions that allow people to understand uh, it, whether or not they were um, uh, in danger. And at that point, that's when we connected it to the Department of Health and other doctors that were able to connect to, to people. So the first thing before we even get to the doctors is a trusted base, someone that can open the door uh, and that, that changes. If you don't have that, none of the things that we build will get directed and connected to our community. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Ms. Morales. Thank you. Um, so, you know, the first thing I would say about the, dealing with this, this infrastructure is that we first have to expand the front end, the preventative care issues. And, you know, rather than get into all of the social determinants of health that, that you know, have been referred to as pre-existing conditions, the environmental justice issues, the housing issues, the, the lack of nutrition, appropriate nutrition. Um, I, you know, we, I'll, I'll talk about sort of from point of beginning, um, you know, expanding preventative care. New York City has fewer sites per person than, than other cities right now in, in terms of access to primary care, which ends up having our community's results rely um, disproportionately on emergency rooms. So we, I would look to, to increase local community-based care through, in, through increasing integrated community health clinics I think we also need to uh, provide and expand health educators and promoters, folks who are culturally relevant, culturally competent, and linguistically uh, appropriate to provide community and neighborhood-based interventions and supports and education so that it's accessible. And finally, I, I think that one of the things that's important to talk about is that our CBOs have to be an integral part of the ecosystem of what I would consider a multidisciplinary approach towards addressing the, the, the shortcomings of our current system and also just rebuilding that trust Thank that I referenced you. earlier. Thank you. All right, with this, we're moving on to our next question. And this has to do with prioritizing equity and how you would do that. Okay, so this pandemic has laid bare enduring inequities that permeate almost every part of our healthcare system. They prevent communities of color, immigrants, people who are LGBTQ, as well as those with disabilities, mental illness, and substance abuse disorders from accessing the health care that they need. So my question to you is this, if elected mayor, would you consider creating a commissioner level post with the charge of promoting and ensuring equity across government agencies and policies. President Biden has done something similar through uh, his domestic policy council. What would you do it? And my first up, I will be asking that of Mr. Stringer. Well, I've already done it. Uh, seven years ago, I appointed the city's first chief diversity officer when the mayor refused to do so. The first was Carol Wallace and now Wendy Garcia. And part of the job for me was to look at $20 billion of procurement spend and how we could direct that money to communities of color to have more MWBEs get contracts to grow in the community. We should expand the role of diversity officer and I will to include issues of equity within city agencies. You would be shocked to know how little money actually goes into our communities. That's true with healthcare, that's true with affordable housing. We all know this to be true, but I've already built an infrastructure agency by agency as controller. I can walk into city hall and just continue what I've been doing. But I also wanna just mention that part of equity is not just telling communities of color what they wanna hear or what you think is best. 
And one of the things I did as Manhattan Borough President is I went into East Harlem, which had the highest rate of asthma issues uh, many years ago. And I started something called Go Green East Harlem. And we work with stakeholders. We built a standalone asthma center because people were afraid to go to the hospital. They didn't feel comfortable. We built out a community round table so we could get fresh food. And we identified very dangerous health conditions in the Thank community. You. And I think we should do that in every community citywide. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, Ms. Wiley. looks like me, no one who thinks like me, no one who has spent 30 years as a racial justice advocate fighting structural racism has ever been mayor. And I sat in City Hall for two and a half years as the person the mayor unofficially designated to, to do things like, you know, get the city government to be racially representative, make sure that we were doing things like getting universal broadband to public housing residents, which we did with Queensbridge Houses. But here's the thing. Yes, I would have a chief diversity officer at commissioner level, but having been in the job, if the mayor doesn't hold that work central, that lens and those principles central, does not know exactly how to tell city government, here's the thing you've never done before that we're gonna now do, like at every unit of Queensbridge Houses, free broadband paid for the government, it doesn't matter that you have that position filled. And that's the mayor I'll be. Thank you. Um, Mr. Manchaka, and, and I also wanna make sure as the candidates respond to this question, it would be a commissioner level position focused on equity and not just diversity. So I, I just wanna um, clarify that. Mr. Manchaka. Thank you. And what I want to say is that the truth is nothing that we have done in the city has actually attacked equity. Nothing that, that you're hearing tonight or that has been attempted has actually done this. Equity means that we have access, equal access to the opportunities that the city has, the funding of all the programs. And one of the biggest issues has been language access. If you look at COVID and what I'm seeing right now from this administration, they lag in time to get quality information to people in non-English languages. That one thing, if this commissioner could have the power to translate everything at the same time, imagine that the mayor is speaking. And in my administration, I will ensure that every time I come out with the message, all the languages will have been pre, uh, pre-translated, that I have, I have an entire team behind me so that everything that I speak on is multi, multilingual and culturally appropriately connected to people on the ground. That one thing can be transformative. Thank you. So you would uh, appoint yeah. a commissioner level position? 100%, absolutely. Fully okay. funded with language access being the front and center piece of this uh, of this office. Thank you, thank you. Ms. Morales. Thank you. Um, you know, I, yeah, sure. Um, I would appoint somebody as, as head of, of equity. I just wanna sort of clarify um, what my colleague Carlos said. Uh, uh, equity is not actually equal. Equity is actually about addressing those communities that have been disproportionately impacted and ensuring that they get the resources that they need. And so, you know, I, we, we currently, we have a Center for Health Equity. We have a Human Rights Commission at the city level. Um, we have these sort of figurehead offices that, uh, that have not been empowered with the resources, the authority, and the accountability to actually ensure that their mission is executed on. And so, you know, whether, whether it's in one position or distributed among the many city agencies, I think the important and critical difference here is that actually the, the mayor fully enforce and hold accountable the leadership of city government to ensure that equity issues are being addressed and that the communities that have been historically left behind are in fact being centered and elevated as we move, fo move forward. However, whatever format it takes, there needs to be a commitment and the teeth behind it to ensure that this is happening. So is uh, having commissioner level position, is that a good idea? I mean, I, I think it's a good idea, but the reality of it is that we also, you know, as someone who has extensive management of multiple departments and, you know, that, that tend to like to operate in silos, 
the reality of it is that the most important thing is going to be how it actually gets implemented and how we ensure that, you know, this sort of top down strategy actually gets to the communities that need it the most. Um, and I'm not, you know, this is the first sort of, I'm thinking about this. I'm not convinced that that's the only way, um, but I certainly think that it's an important signal if it's, if it's uh, backed up with, with the sort of in, uh, enforceability and accountability that needs to be. Thank you. Um, so General Sutton, um, what would you do? So certainly I would emphasize the importance, particularly in light of what the pandemic has laid bare for us, the importance of equity issues. I would not create more bureaucracy or another position, be it at the commissioner level or otherwise. As mayor, that would be part and parcel. I mean, that would be one of my core values that I would lay out in a values manifesto and would share with city government and make sure that all of city government understands these are the values of a Sutton administration. And we can teach you if you're not sure what it means and you need some help uh, acting in accordance with these values, or if you know that you just, you want to, you know, do something different or uh, maintain the status quo, then you're probably going to want to find uh, work elsewhere. And I think that equity has to be burning in the heart and soul of every single individual within city government it has to be led by the mayor. Thank you. Um, so you would not create a new position. Is there someone um, within a current role or a current position that you would charge with quarterbacking this effort? I would, I, I would take that on as my responsibility and I would then work through the various avenues and levers and agencies within government and track the data to make sure that we're having the desired impact. But I'll tell you, it's not enough just to lead it from within city hall or across the agencies. You gotta actually get out there into the communities and talk to folks and find out what's working. I was livid last week when I read that article about the broadband. I'm sure you were too, Maya. My gosh, you know, there's a smart way to do this. There are places that have figured it out. You can do it in the hallway and you get three apartments for a fraction of the cost. What's wrong with us? We have to listen to the communities. They will tell us what they need. And then we have to uphold the values and make sure that we deliver on those commitments. Thank you. Thank you. So my next question concerns New York Health and Hospitals. So New York City's public health and hospital system serves hundreds of thousands of low-income uninsured patients every year. Policy experts and advocates have long argued that it is underfunded by state lawmakers that control the allocation of billions of dollars in indigent care pool and Medicaid. And just this past week, the governor's budget proposed to slash funding for New York City's public hospitals by another $139 million. Now, mayors typically have been able to turn this situation around. My question to you all would be, what would you do to improve the financial stability of New York Health and Hospitals? And I will ask that first of Ms. Wiley. So one reason, in addition to going to the state and trying to get more of our disproportionate share dollars, which helps bring more resources into our public hospital system, is to actually go after Part of the root cause of the reasons that we're in trouble is because of act, having patients who have access to an insurance card that pays for the services they have. So I'm actually looking at creating a program that actually takes and looks at the 600,000 folks who do not have insurance, who are by and large the folks who are being cared for by our hospital system. That actually helps us bring resources, not just in to save the system, which is critical, but also to ensure that folks have the ability, just as Diane said, to reduce reliance on hospitals for what really is about being able to see a doctor when you're sick, but also about preventing some of the problems that create the, the visit in the first place. One of the things we're gonna do is we have a new deal, New York, which is a WPA style program to get 100,000 folks back to 100,000 new jobs, we're gonna focus on hard hit communities. We're gonna create jobs where they need it and ensure insurance where it's needed as well. And Thank that you. is part of it. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Menchaca. 
Thank you, Cheryl, for this for this question. I think we've all been looking, uh, especially if we're in the city uh, negotiating budgets, what's been happening recently with the changes in healthcare and how people are now able to go to private hospitals uh, and shop around for, for access to healthcare. I think what's really interesting is that health and hospitals has become a place for folks that do not have primary care physicians and they use the emergency room. We got to move away from emergency rooms. And that's why I want to bring healthcare to the people. I want to make sure that we can build relationships. Um, there's also a really great uh, plan that has come out from the uh, Citizens Budget Commission that recommends that we develop a new approach to financial planning and budgeting with health and hospitals um, and, this, and, and, and OMB. I think those recommendations uh, that we can all look up are gonna be important. But the final thing is that when we remove people from emergency room experiences, we're gonna be able to decrease the cost per, uh, per family. And that means that we bring healthcare to uh, schools and our community centers. Thank you. Um, Ms. Morales. Thanks. Um, so, you know, I'll just reiterate that I, I still believe that the best way for us to decrease um, hospital costs is to actually invest in preventative care. I think that is far and, and beyond the, the best way for us to effectively manage costs in the hospital system. That being said, I also think there's something to be said for uh, looking at the indigent care pool and creating a policy or making it less likely or less accessible to private hospitals or richer hospitals like Presbyterian that are getting a disproportionate size of that pool uh, than safety net hospitals like Bellevue, Woodhall or, or Elm Elmhurst might be. Uh, several years ago, many of you have heard me talk about this. I waited in the hallways of an emergency room with my daughter for access to a men adolescent mental health bed because there had been such a shrinking of, the, of those resources and that availability. I think you know, one of the things that's really troubling is that hundreds of millions of dollars have actually flowed away from our struggling hospitals that serve the largest number of uninsured and low-income patients to go to instead hospitals with healthier bottom lines. So I really think that we need to move towards a system and we would move towards a system, I would advocate to move towards a system where these funds are only given to safety net hospitals and not given to the, to the wealthier private hospitals. Thank you, thank you. General Sutton. Absolutely. I think that um, the points that have been made in terms of preventive care are important. Also what's critically important in terms of rebalancing the role of hospitals and moving away from the emergency care and the intensive care, but you always have to have those capabilities to be sure. But we also need to invest heavily in, um, in chronic disease management. Those things, you know, diabetes, heart disease, you know, bring them into the wellness services, but also have a way of maintaining that relationship and that care that keeps people from getting into the emergency room. Another issue, and I, I think that this doesn't get enough attention, but we have such a haphazard, uh, it's not even a system, but a, a um, just a mess of coverage plans and discontinuities. And we need to we need to incentivize continuous coverage so that those relationships can pay off so that the hospitals can invest in wellness and preventive services and so that we can have really a whole health approach towards health care and not just think of the hospitals. Thank you. Mr. Stringer. I do believe that we need to have uh, a whole hands on deck approach to H&H. &H. Uh, we have 11 hospitals, many are struggling, but we need to beef up the security of the finances. As controller, I supported the mayor when he invested wisely $300 million in the early days of the administration with Mitchell Katz and others to get H&H &H stabilized. We now have the opportunity with Biden to use FEMA money for H&H. &H. That's now 100% reimbursement. We should immediately move to that. And also, I do agree with those saying that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And obviously, prevention is the key. But I just want to say for those who are uninsured, uh, for, for those who have insurance, you know, when you choose an in network provider, you know, you ask a lot of questions. You want to make sure that with limited income, 
you're going to ask the doctor how much it costs, what do I have to pay? And then you think you've navigated that, and then you get a huge bill from the hospital. Huge bill. You can't imagine what happened. And that's that's become like going to a game of roulette, right? The house always wins. The bills are enormous. And we need to end surprise billing. And I want state legislation and work with the members of the city council locally. We've got to prevent surprise billing because it keeps people away from primary care. It puts people into a cycle of debt. And there's no advocate who steps up and says, tear that up, tear that bill up. Thank if you. you Thank you. About surprise billing, you should be held harmless. I do want to ask a follow up. How would you work with the governor on this? Well, one of the things that I do think, and I'm a former assembly member, so I get it. We have to reset the Albany relationship. Uh, I'm going to work with the governor and the state legislature. Uh, I've already working with many legislators. I'm proud to have the endorsement of most of uh, many of the progressive state senators who now run the state Senate, Jessica Ramos, uh, Senator Jackson, uh, Assemblywoman Yuli New, uh, 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 Senator Julia Salazar, these are the folks that I'm gonna work with as well as the governor to make sure that we get a New York City agenda. You gotta recognize that the future of the city does run through Albany. And the second thing we gotta remind people, and we're gonna have to build a coalition, we send $22 billion more to the federal government that we get back, enough already. The Trump stimulus package went to Wall Street. We now have to fight for Main Street and our communities. And as a mayor, you got to begin organizing now so that when you have that agenda, you actually get the things you need done. Thank you. Thank you. So now we do have some time for some more questions, which is great. Thank you all. Um, this next question is about protecting patients from medical bills that they can't afford. And some of you have um, touched on that before. But 60% of New York City residents say they faced a healthcare affordability burden in the prior year. And over 6,000 New York City residents have been sued by New York's nonprofit charitable hospitals for medical bills, often at a 9% commercial interest rate. Hospital lawyers usually win these cases on default, and most patients do not appear in court, do not have lawyers. Um, many hospitals have paused this practice during the pandemic. However, what would you do as mayor to protect patients and prevent nonprofit hospitals from filing these lawsuits and other unfair and discriminatory, discriminatory <laughs> hospital practices beyond the pandemic? And I will ask that question first of Mr. Menchaca. Thank you for this question. And you know, as council member, we get we get cases like this that come in all the time. Uh, there's a lot of fear that's connected. Many of them are immigrant communities who don't understand um, exactly what's going on. Lawyers are critical. So one of the things that I think we need to do as a city is actually bring more lawyers to uh, to support the current uh, and group of of um, patients. Much of this is misunderstood as well. Um, I think that there, when there are when there's ability to pay, people can pay. Um, but what we really need to do is bring more investment from the city. Uh, and I think we already spoke to how we can change the way that debt is managed with, with, these, uh, with these hospitals. But that's going to require a state and city investment uh, into the hospital system. Uh, without that, we're going we're gonna to stay in, a, in, an, oppor in a, an opportunist position for each of these hospitals. Uh, there's good legislation out there that was already mentioned uh, that I support as well. Okay, thank you. And um, Ms. Morales. Thank you so much. Um, you know, one of the things I was thinking about as uh, I was thinking about the, this question is, you know, uh, some of the hospital finance assistance programs right now, uh, the, first of all, they, they, they vary from hospital to hospital. Some are actually asking for social security numbers um, as part of a sort of a tactic to, to scare undocumented immigrants or undocumented people. From, uh, from applying for financial assistance. And, and that's actually an illegal practice. Um, so I think one of the things that I think about is the, the Patient Medical Debt Protection Act um, that would actually help to, by requiring, first of all, hospitals to pro provide one itemized bill instead of the current situation, I think that we all you know deal with when you, when you go to the hospital where you get hit with 
three or four bills, you think you're done, and then you get another bill. Um, and it's, it's confusing and overwhelming at best. Um, under the best of circumstances for those of us who understand and are prepared for it. Um, and really, uh, you know, it can be very, very challenging. I'm um, also, you know, really thinking about look, or looking at banning facilities fees that, that uh, hospitals now charge just for the use of the facility and, um, and also the financial liability waiver forms, which also I think serve as, a, as an intimidation tactic for, for many, many folks. Um, really the idea of standardizing the hospital financial assistance practice policies and, and the form Thank so you. that there's Thank, Thank you. And um, General Sutton. Sure. I think there's several things that need to be done here. First of all, let's just agree that no family should ever face financial duress or even bankruptcy because one of its members happens to become ill. That's just wrong. And thank God we're in a position now where we don't have to constantly worry about the guy in the White House trying to take away, strip away the pre-existing, uh, the coverage for pre-existing conditions. But we're not out of the woods by any stretch yet. There's so much work to be done. And some of it's been mentioned already in terms of the legislation that's afoot to address this issue of uh, surprise billing. One of the reasons I so, uh, uh, loved working in military medicine for all of those years is that we never had to ask a patient how sick they could afford to be. We never had to do a wallet biopsy when they came in through the clinic or the emergency room. And I think we need to take some of those principles and adopt them to our current uh, system throughout the city and the state. And I also think it's so important there are th reforms we can do in terms of malpractice reform. We can stop paying for preventable medical errors and we can start incentivizing the long-term chronic care as well as the wellness and prevention care that's so critical uh, to, to maintain health and not just focus on health care. Thank you. And Mr. Stringer. Well, I, I think I got a little ahead of myself and raised the issue, but again, I do think we need federal, state, and city legislation where we see this billing and these uh, surprise uh, costs that can bankrupt uh, a family. I do think we need to hold those families, those individuals harmless, and I'll work with various stakeholders to make sure we get the necessary changes. Thank you. And Ms. Wiley. So there has been federal legislation that helps for some plans and there is state legislation in Albany, as we have all said, we, I, I totally agree that it's critically important that we partner with our state delegation to get that through and we have more opportunity to do that. The city's bargaining power and ability to partner with large nonprofits like our university system, CUNY is one of, the, is one of the reasons tuition goes up is because cost of medical care go up. It actually, there's so many different benefits we can derive, but, but in creating partnerships that actually put us in a collaborative that the city uses its power of 1.25, I think, million folks that we have that the city is providing insurance for to demand transparency and billing because there is price gouging, but we can make that transparent. We can make it public we can call attention to it and we can use collective bargaining power also to create more accountability in the system, but not just with the city, but with our partners. And then, you know, we have to have consumer protections and enforcement and we have to do it well. And we have to make sure that folks who have language access issues, folks that have other reasons why they may be more easily taken advantage of, get the legal services and supports they need to make sure they're not. Thank you. So we have time uh, for another question. And so this one is uh, about a very um, troubling trend. And it's the uh, racial gap in maternal deaths. Between 2011 and 2015, black women accounted for 54% of pregnancy related deaths, but only 20% of births. Meanwhile, white women accounted for 11% of pregnancy related deaths, but 33% of births. My question for you, what would you do as mayor to address the maternity mortality, the maternal, ma wow, that's a tongue twister, maternal mortality crisis experienced by black and brown women in New York City? 
And I will first ask that to Ms. Morales. So this hits, um, this hits close to home. Um, I almost died as a result of um, the racism in the healthcare system after complaining years of, of, of pain. This was a, a female issue. It was not um, maternity uh, oriented, but it, it definitely was a, a female issue. Um, you know, I think, I think we need to increase the pipeline, the training pipeline to the, into the medical profession for black and brown folks that are culturally competent and can actually um, hear and respond to the needs of black women. Um, I also think we need to um, enforce accountability measures for um, the, the system and folks in, uh, that are part of the system who um, disregard that and particularly where it results in, in any harm to, to our women. Um, and I, I think that we need to find, find ways to provide for advocacy for black and brown women in the system so that they are on the front end, given the support that they need in terms of navigating. I know that I was trying, you know, for a long time that I was not being heard. I was not being heard. And there was no mechanism for me to elevate or escalate my concerns. Um, so I think that those things are really critical. Um, and we need to address this issue because it is literally killing our black women. Thank you. Thank you. Could you talk a little bit about, um, you know, you, you found that there was no mechanism uh, available um, and it's very important to address this. But could you talk a little more details about what that mechanism might be, where you think it might be most effective or in your own experience, where the mechanism fell short and who that was or what organization? Agency. I mean, I mean, in my own experience, what I ended up doing was going from one doctor to another, trying to sort of address the issue, right? Um, and then, as a as a woman of color, I think you know there is that there is that myth about us having a higher tolerance for pain. Um, but then there is actually a little bit of a reality to that too. I think we do internalize that and we carry it for longer than we need to because that is part of the expectation. Um, I did not have um, through the system. Um, a, a sort of a, a number to call or an advocate, a patient advocate, if you will, or a community sort of advocate that I could take my concerns to that would that I could be confident would then sort of escalate and elevate those concerns in a way that could be could result in a meaningful change for me. Um, and so it, it actually wasn't even until after it had happened that I fully understood how the system had played out and how it had impacted me um, at, at that point adversely. So, you know, I, I really think that there is, there, there should be culturally competent mechanisms for women to access the advocacy um, and, and sort of legal Thank you. Yeah, Thank you. protection. Yeah. Yes, General Sutton. I would absolutely agree that there have to be mechanisms which are culturally uh, appropriate, sensitive, available, accessible. And even so, uh, this isn't available to everyone, but you know, when you go into a clinic or a hospital setting, you may not have a loved one that can come with you, but everybody needs an advocate. And if it's a neighbor, if it's a, a system that the, the hospital set up, you know, many hospitals have ombudsman systems, not, not all of them, of course, are culturally sensitive or appropriate or accessible uh, linguistically, but I think that this is where we have to head. The data needs to be clear, the data needs to be transparent so folks can see what the difference is from one clinic or one system of care versus another, and competition is good. When the data is transparent, that helps force needed change. But I think this issue is so complex and it's tied into all the things that Diane uh, mentioned and it's completely unacceptable and it has to it has to change on multiple multiple systems levels now how would you um how would you you know you talked about measures uh, how would you and who would you hold accountable so let's just take the the um uh the issue of uh, preventable medical errors. I mentioned that a little bit earlier. There's a, you know, there's a group of uh, conditions of medical errors that we know are preventable. That data needs to be increasingly transparent and we ought to be able to crosswalk that data 
by race, by age, by gender, by ethnicity, and we ought to be able to do it by geography. And I think that the data will help the systems to change, but it's always, data's never going to be enough, but it's necessary. And then we as a community and led by the mayor and a compassionate and data-driven administration will work hand in hand with communities and systems of care to force those changes. We ought to be a leader. <laughs> New York City, we're the world. We ought to be a leader in this area of redressing these disparities. It's unconscionable. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Stringer. Well, let me first say that this is a conversation that has to happen within our healthcare system. People talk about more investment in doulas, more investment in prevention, giving better, greater access to healthcare as relates to pregnancy. But look, I have to say, uh, guys, step aside and, and, and listen, uh, because the uh, women who have suffered and who have literally almost lost their lives uh, in this two-tier system, uh, this has to be solved. And I'd be the first to say that we need to do better listening to the people on the front lines about building uh, a prenatal care system. And I will work with all stakeholders to do that. Thank you. And um, Ms. Wiley. So, when I was lobbying on health care reform for the Leadership Conference of Civil Rights back in the 90s, we were actively fighting to get civil rights protections into the bill in order to hold providers accountable for this kind of biased outcome and implicit bias and racism. And one of the things that I would do as mayor, and I'm a, I'm a black woman that had a black OBGYN and doulas, and had my first daughter in a birthing center and my second daughter at home backed up by providers who absolutely empowered my health care and listened to every single thing I said. And what that is what so many women don't have who are black in the city. So one of the things we have to do is we have to build and expand upon a program that just got created in 2018 to track the data, make it public and hold accountable where the implicit bias is happening because the outcomes are just wrong. Secondly, what we have to do is build upon the network of peer to peer, and I would do this through social service agencies and others, but where we have women able to provide supports and education, peer to peer education for one another about exactly how you navigate the system and get protection and hold it. Okay, thank you. And Mr. Menchaca. Thank you, Cheryl, for this question. As a cisgendered man who is um, so separated from this conversation, I would really take the story um, and the experiences of Black and Brown women to lead this. I think what's really important here is that we empower them to, sh to shift and change, not just resources, but really place accountability where it needs to happen. Um, some of the stories that I'm hearing as a council member uh, and the chair of the immigration committee are really connected to indigenous families that are growing by the number and are uh, failing to access all the things that we're talking about. Uh, they speak indigenous languages that uh, we're not even talking about in this mayoral race. And so I would step not only aside, but give them the power uh, to build this next stage and um, real action plan for this crisis. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, with that, we do have some time for a very brief 30 second uh, closing remarks from each candidate. Um, uh, I will start with Ms. Morales. So uh, sorry. Um, thank you, thank you for um, for the opportunity. I, you know, I really appreciate having had the opportunity to have this conversation tonight. I, I think we need to recognize that the existing systems and structures that have disproportionately impacted our black and brown communities existed long before COVID-19 and that we need to move forward in a way that is focused on and centered on a, an equity lens that will prioritize and center the communities that have been so disproportionately impacted. The data from the current crisis 
go for it. Okay. I'll, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Um, General Sutton. Well, thank you so much. This has been a really great conversation. I've learned so much. I just want to close on one thing and that, that is taking it back to the, the work of my life in mental health. Uh, I, I neglected to mention earlier that New York State has Kendra's Law. It's the best law in the nation when it comes to ensuring that seriously mentally ill individuals get the care they need, even if it needs, needs to be in a hospital or in a community supervised setting. This administration has not developed implementation and enforcement of that law. And I think the next mayor is in a position for the sake of all of us to do just that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Stringer. Well, I think we addressed a lot of the fundamental issues related to hospitals and healthcare. Let me round up just some of my thinking briefly. Look, we do have a crisis and it's called environmental racism. We have issues of climate change disproportionate in communities of color. I'm proud to have just led as controller the largest divestment of fossil fuels in America. And we did it through the lens of building out an environmentally fair society that will reduce the kind of health disparities we talked about. I also think we have to double down on building low income housing and making sure that people who built our neighborhoods, the pioneers, the people who came with very little and built up our neighborhoods that now everyone wants to live in, we need to carve out safe places for all of the people in this city. And that is as much about health disparity, preventative care. When we build supportive housing, we're also saving people in our neighborhoods. So that Thank is you. what rounds out this issue. Thank you for having me, by the way. Great conversation. Wonderful. Thank you. And Ms. Wiley. Uh, and thank you, Cheryl. Um, listen, we, I, I lead by listening, learning, and leading in partnership. And one of the things that we did that we didn't get to talk about tonight, as wonderful as this conversation was, is gun violence, which is a public health issue. And one of the things that we have said we will do is create an $18 million participatory justice fund, which enables communities that are impacted by gun violence to say what they need invested in in their communities with those dollars. And that can include trauma-informed care, that can include anything. We'd also do it in the context of a New Deal New York in terms of what infrastructure solves people's and communities' problems. And I hope you'll go to mayawileyformayor.com, sign up for one of our People's Assemblies, because that has been informing our policy proposals. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Manchaka. Thank you again for having me. Buenas noches. And I hope everyone takes care of themselves and their families and friends. Um, this mayoral race is wide open. And I know New York wants someone who has been experienced and not just being an elected official, but someone who's been fighting with track record. I am that candidate and I'm looking forward to talking more with you. Carlos2021.com. Sign up and let's keep talking. Muchas gracias. Thank you. Thank you very much. And this concludes our first session. I want to thank our candidates for sharing their plans to address health equity. Uh, and I want to thank them for being um, brief. It was, you know, a lot to get in. Um, and I'm glad we did. Uh, we will be taking a short break after which the next session and our next slate of candidates will begin at 730. So we've got about four minutes. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank See you guys. Bye, everyone. Bye. 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 Good night.
Good evening. Welcome back. I'm your moderator, Cheryl Huggins Salomon, Chief Communications Officer at the NYU McSilver Institute for Poverty Policy and Research. Once again, we are focusing on how the next mayor will address inequities in our healthcare system, issues of affordability, access to quality care, and equal treatment and services across the system. These are uh, issues that existed prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, but which have been laid bare by the virus. I wanna do a little bit of a reset, um, particularly for those who may not have joined our first session. Uh, I'm going to introduce this evening's session to candidates in alphabetical order, and then refresh everyone on rules of the road. First, please welcome Eric Adams, who was elected Brooklyn Borough President in 2014. He is a retired a captain with NYPD and a former state senator. Sean Donovan served as HUD secretary and the director of the Office of Management and Budget in the Obama administration. Catherine Garcia served as commissioner of the NYC uh, Sanitation Department and she was chief operating officer for the New York City Department of Environmental Protection under Mayor de Blasio. And we also have Ray McGuire, who is a former executive with Citicor, a multinational investment bank and financial services corporation. And we have Andrew Yang, who is founder of Venture for America, a nonprofit focused on creating jobs in cities recovering from the Great Recession. The questions I will be asking have been prepared by the forum sponsors and are informed in part by Community Thanks. Service Society's unheard annual unheard survey of low-income New Yorkers. Candidates have not seen the questions in advance. Each question will have one minute to respond, and the time limit will also apply to follow-up questions. If candidates exceed the time limit, I will let them know with a respectful thank you, after which we will promptly move on to the next question or candidate. Because time is limited, we respectfully ask that candidates' replies focus on their own plans for the city and not what their opponents may be doing. And for the same reason, we ask the candidates uh, not to speak out of turn, because I'm going to call on everybody and make sure that everybody uh, has a chance in a predetermined order. Uh, I'll also be asking follow-up questions in some cases. So we have a full slate of questions in a tight window. So we're also not taking questions from the audience, but this is what we will be doing. We are monitoring audience comments and will highlight at some points throughout the program uh, their comments on a virtual banner. With that, let us begin. So uh, first off, this first question is about increasing COVID-19 vaccinations in communities of color. Community Service Society issued a report today it found that 36% of Latinx and 31% of Black New Yorkers said they or a family member had COVID-19 versus 21% of white people. And as of this week, New York City has vaccinated just 5% of the population. So candidates, what would you do to ramp up vaccine distribution in New York? And would you prioritize distribution in communities of color over other groups? If so, how would you do that? And um, I will first ask Mr. Adams. Do we have Mr. Adams? Yes, thank you. Just for clarity, so we know the rules of engagement. Do you have a time limit you want your questions answered by? Uh, one minute, please. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I, I put out a plan back on uh, the 3rd of January that 15 of my colleagues signed on to that laid out how do we reach uh, three goals. Uh, one, how do we have our high need individuals? Second, those communities that were uh, disproportionately impacted by COVID-19. And third, how do we reach herd immunity? Uh, we have failed to execute this plan or any plan in real time. I will focus on those communities that were hardest hit uh, during COVID-19. I know them so well because I was among them as I moved throughout the city. Uh, but I will also do it in a transparent way. You could have a handheld, every time you inject someone, it goes into a device, uploads to a mapping system that would show that we're moving steadily towards those communities that were disproportionately impacted. Right now, to date, after repeated calls, we have yet to know 
who was actually vaccinated in the ethnicities. That is wrong. Thank you. Thank you. And um, can you talk a little bit more um, about this tracking system? Is this a tracking system that is um, with people who have been vaccinated? And if so, if it is, um, for, for instance, an app, um, how would you ensure equity in that, given that there is a bit of a digital divide? No, and it's nothing. The, the individuals who are actually being vaccinated, they don't have anything to do. You okay. walk inside a location, you're vaccinated. The person who issued the vaccine will put the information that we are already collecting. Keep that in mind. You'll put it in a system that's transparent, that will be uploaded, uploaded to a central database. So we will monitor in real time the zip codes, the ethnicities, the gender. 28% of the vaccines that were issued went to people outside the city of New York. Some did not work in the city of New York. And we have yet to um, have the accurate data on the ethnicity and the demographics who, of who received the vaccine. That's unacceptable. Thank you, Mr. Adams. And now I will ask Mr. Donovan. Thanks, Cheryl. And I, I wanna agree with Eric that we need better transparency and tracking across racial lines for how the vaccine is being rolled out. It, it's unforgivable that's happening. But we also have to remember that one of the fundamental problems is we're not getting enough vaccine here in New York City. One of the unique things I bring to this race is my deep relationships with uh, President Biden and Vice President Harris. In fact, the person leading my health policy team is now going to be on the COVID-19 team in the White House uh, for President Biden and Vice President Harris. So we need someone who can make sure we're getting our fair share uh, in New York City of the vaccine and putting it to work quickly. We also have to recognize that what underlies this problem is a much deeper problem in inequities in black and brown communities in New York. I have a proposal for what I call 15 minute neighborhoods. Every New Yorker, no matter where they live, the color of their skin, what language they speak, should have access to the healthcare they need in their, in their neighborhood. One of the fundamental problems is we don't have the healthcare infrastructure in black and brown communities that we need. I would fix that long-term problem as well as mayor to make sure that everyone can get vaccinated. Thank you, thank you. And, and, and if you'll let me um, follow up, I, I wanted to ask you because um, you were involved in the federal uh, Ebola response with the Obama administration. Uh, I guess my question to you is, um, were there any lessons that you learned uh, even as budget director that you would apply toward um, ramping up the vaccine distribution and making sure that it's equitable in New York? Absolutely, Cheryl, I appreciate you asking. Um, I was deeply involved, in fact, side by side within the Situation Room with Dr. Fauci, as well as our military leaders, uh, working across West Africa, as well as in the US. One of the lessons we learned, and we set the stage really for the speed of the vaccine development, I think there's even more that we can be doing to not just develop new vaccines, but to make sure that these emerging variants, that we update vaccines quickly. And we need someone in City Hall who can work with our leaders uh, like Dr. Fauci and others to be able to make sure that that happens. A second thing I would say is that fundamentally, we made sure Ebola didn't become a pandemic because we did deploy very, very rapidly um, testing and tracing capacity in a way that Mayor de Blasio hasn't in this city. That was done by using every single agency that we had available, including our military uh, leadership. That's something that we did not do effectively in New York. Every Thank time you. any agency touches uh, any New Yorker, we ought to be using that contact and that interaction as a way to make sure that we are doing contact tracing and, and testing through Thank the you. latest technology. Thank you. Um, Ms. Garcia. Thank you for that question. I put out a plan last week on how we could rapidly ramp up vaccinating our most vulnerable population. So it isn't whoever can get through one of the three websites and score a concert ticket like vaccine appointment. Uh, we should have been far more thoughtful about how we distributed it. And I have said that I would reserve to 25% of, of the vaccines for those who are homebound seniors, 
for those who are people in NYCHA. We need to rely on our community-based organizations who are trusted by seniors to ensure that we are getting vaccines to that population. We should have looked at it through the lens of, would they be able to manage a, a website form? I think not. I think we should have been calling them to ask them when they could have an appointment. Thank you. Thank you. I want to ask you a follow up to that. Um, since uh, you uh, were leading um, the city's um, uh, uh, COVID-19 um, food uh, distribution and also um, uh, food supply, um, can you uh, talk a little bit about how that experience then um, uh, would inform how you would fix vaccine distribution if mayor? Absolutely. So different from the vaccine is we didn't know we were going to need a food distribution system until we were hit by the pandemic. And literally almost overnight, I set up a team with technology to distribute what ended up being 130 million meals. Uh, you have to leverage everything you have. Taxi drivers were the delivery system. We brought in more folks on tech. The teams at the sites were made up of National Guard, DOT, DEP. You need to throw everything in the kitchen sink at something as important as vaccines and break it into chunks. Where is the supply? How is cold storage being managed? Are you actually solving for the right problem? Are you identifying the most vulnerable and ensuring that they get shots? Uh, and how are you tracking it? So as the borough president said, transparency is key as we move through this process. Thank you. Thank you. And um, Mr. McGuire. Yes. Hi. Hi. Your question is COVID and the response? A vaccine, yes. How would you ramp up distribution, but also um, ensure that is equitably distributed? So let me start by saying I have invested in healthcare deeply and I have managed through crises. What did not occur here was responding to that which we knew. And I've written about the systemic inequities in healthcare. We knew the areas of concentration of the highest impact of COVID. And what we should have done from the outset was prioritize those areas. And I've written about how we should not only prioritize, but monitor with data how those areas were being treated. And I would have made certain that the vaccines were prepared and ready on site in those geographies that were the most at risk. We didn't plan for it. We're now on the defense and many of the people who could have been treated early have now been left with, the, with this horrid disease. And we needed to access all of our relationships here to make certain that, that the COVID was readily available. We know who the healthcare companies are. We know how the transaction was negotiated <laughs> from the start. And we knew the, we knew the failures in the system that could have been predicted that eventually came to pass. So we Thank would identify you. early. I do want to ask you a follow up on that, given um, your experience in the private sector. Could you talk about um, how um, you would ensure that the public and private sector are working together close in hand um, to ramp up distribution? What are some best practices, things that you've learned that you would apply as mayor? I, I, I know of the best practices in some of the private side where the execution was planned for many days ahead of time and where they followed the protocols of, of who should get vaccinated first. And not only did they execute, they executed to the point where they ran out of the vaccine. So they executed according to plan to which they planned and they tried to interact with many of the existing facilities and were prepared to lend the services, but those facilities didn't have the appropriate leadership, which starts at the which starts at the top, which starts with the mayor's office, inadequately planned for and aptly executed, which is now still being inadequately executed. Okay, and and how would you do that differently? I would make certain that the private sector and this and the practices, and and I can't tell you it was perfect. I can tell you that it was well executed, but I would make certain that they could interact with which they did with many of the, with the public facilities, but the public facilities, the public facilities didn't have the resources and didn't have the, didn't have the, the authority to execute 
on the plans that many of the private uh, hospitals did have the authority and the wherewithal, the resources to execute. So I'd make certain there's better integration, which there was, but I would also make certain that the leadership that didn't occur, that could allow that integration, that the leadership was there. And I would leverage the private sector best practices and the public sector best practices. And I would make certain that they get executed in the geographies with black and brown people who are the most at risk, who have suffered the most from COVID. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Yang. So many New Yorkers are frustrated right now because we're in the midst of a crisis and we know the vaccine is our pathway out. Uh, but the vaccine supply has been insufficient. People are frustrated with, as Catherine suggested, there are multiple websites and organizations to try and make an appointment. Uh, and then the prioritization is unclear. So number one is supply. Uh, we are the original epicenter of COVID-19. Pfizer is literally a New York company. And it reminds me of the PPE competition under Trump where all of the localities were competing for resources and were bidding against each other. New York City needs to have an adequate supply of the vaccine as that's job one. And the mayor should have been working toward that goal continuously until we were sure that we had enough of the vaccine. Number two is our healthcare information system do not talk to each other, which is why Catherine's right about how fragmented it is. We need to have one intake so that people can know where they can get their vaccine, what's the most convenient location for them. The best resource that exists in that direction right now, I think is being run by ABC Eyewitness News, which is not what you need if you're going to restore confidence in our government. The third thing is that we should be vaccinating essential workers who are more disproportionately of color. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, I wanna ask you a follow-up about that um, because you have talked about um, uh, a vaccination passport of sorts uh, and using that. And um, I wanted to ask you uh, about that and also uh, ask you how that would, in using that and using technology, you would ensure that is equitably um, applied given the fact that there is a digital divide um, between white and black and brown and communities of color and low income communities. Uh, New York City is a place-based economy. Uh, we need to be able to convene in schools, uh, in businesses, eventually in restaurants and bars. And so after you get vaccinated, there is something that universally happens. You get a card and it says your name, how, where, where and when you got vaccinated, whether it was the first dose, the second dose, everyone gets one of those cards. Now, the goal is to try and add value to this card by, as Eric suggested, actually uh, um, checking in with a database so that you can have that information confirmed. And if you do have a smartphone, you can just show, it shows green, says you've been vaccinated in a particular time frame, or during this interim period, perhaps that you've gotten a negative test in the last little while. Now, do you need a system where you can also just present that vaccination card and then have someone confirm it manually? Yes. Um, that is lower impact because someone can't confirm it against the database, which the app can do, but everyone gets that card. And eventually we have to get to a point where to drop your child off at school, for example, you can flash that card, someone looks at it, knows you've been vaccinated, you can enter that school safely. Thank you, thank you. Uh, this next question about is about immigrants' access to health insurance. Federal and state policies limit eligibility and discourage access to health programs available to citizens and lawful residents. That results in higher uninsured rates among immigrants. As mayor, what types of programs or policies would you champion to maximize enrollment of immigrants in quality insurance coverage that they can also afford? And I will first ask this question of Mr. Donovan. Thank you, Cheryl. Um, as someone who worked very closely to make sure that we created the Affordable Care Act and implemented it, um, in a way that would reach so many Americans. What we know is that we have to build on that with a true public option that is available to all New Yorkers, regardless of immigration status. And I would work closely with the Biden-Harris administration to try to get that done. The risks are high that won't happen given a 50-50 Senate. Uh, we ought to be working with our state legislature to make it happen at least at the state level. But if our state government or our federal government won't follow through as mayor, I would create a true public option available uh, to the 300,000 undocumented folks who are not covered. 
We should also remember though that creating insurance and insurance coverage is not enough. We know that there are more than 300,000 New Yorkers who are eligible for insurance and don't have it. And so what we need to do is create a real system to reach those folks. That's what we did under the Affordable Care Act. As budget director, I funded navigators that made sure they were working with community-based organizations to reach folks and, and make sure that they're enrolled, as well as creating the health infrastructure, as I said before, in communities of color so that there is real access, not just Thank insurance, you. but access available. Thank you. Um, Ms. Garcia. We need to make sure that immigrants have access to health care. We should expand New York City Cares to cover them so that they can have a relationship with the primary care doctor. That is how you protect people in the long run. One of the things we saw in COVID is that there were lots of underlying conditions that made you so much more vulnerable. If they're not managed, it puts your life at risk. It also is more effective than them ending up in the emergency room. It's the most expensive type of care that we provide. Um, but we also know that there, even with insurance, people were not getting the care they needed. They were not getting their primary care appointments. There was not access in many neighborhoods uh, to doctors and to specialists. We need to see that change. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. McGuire. Do we have Mr. McGuire? Sorry, you had me muted. We need, can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, we need to focus on expanding quality healthcare in neighborhoods that currently have limited access. We need to get more New Yorkers connected to primary care facilities in every borough and ensure that quality healthcare is available notwithstanding the zip code. We also need to make certain that we expand emergency care. There is a effort now by the Health and Hospitals Corporation to expand on express care centers so that you don't have to use the large hospitals to care for those who need urgent care. And we need to expand that. So the answer is we need, yes, to have quality health care for all New Yorkers, independent of zip code and independent of income. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Yang. Opportunity here in part because the emergency room is unfortunately uh, serving as primary care for many of these folks that are uninsured. Uh, there have been very, very admirable efforts to try and get more folks coverage uh, through NY Cares, through these neighborhood action centers. I would suggest that we need a neighborhood action center in Queens, one of the most diverse uh, areas, um, and obviously has a, a very high level of immigrants. Um, and that would be, to me, one of the first things we need to do. Um, the goal should be to, to try to get folks coverage regardless of their documentation st status. And one of the most powerful tools to do that is IDNYC. Uh, IDNYC is available to all New Yorkers. We have to try and tie uh, basic access to both healthcare and financial services through IDNYC and let folks know that even if they have this ID, it's only going to be used in ways that are gonna give them access. We're not going to um, you know, track them or do something that they would mistrust in some way. Uh, that has to be one of the primary goals of the next mayor is to restore that trust Thank you. Thank you. This next question is about equity in healthcare for communities of color in outer boroughs. So um, COVID-19 pandemic is illuminating the devastating toll that unequal distribution of healthcare infrastructure has had on our city's communities of color, uh, particularly in the outer boroughs. And in 2020, Manhattan had 6.4 hospital beds for every 1,000 residents while Queens had only 1.5 hospital beds for every thousand residents. Similar disparities exist in the Bronx and in Brooklyn. Now communities have heard a lot of lip service from policymakers about addressing healthcare system inequities. What would you do as mayor to ensure that the healthcare infrastructure, this is very important, we're talking about infrastructure, not just access. What would you do to ensure that it is distributed equitably? And I will first ask that question of Ms. Garcia. Thank you. No, it, it is shocking the disparity of hospitals and many hospitals that have closed in the outer boroughs. Um, we need to do a couple of things. We need to ensure that we shore up H&H. &H. It is a critical asset 
we it, we relied on it heavily. We need to have H and H and the private system work together. We may not be able to build a full new hospital in every neighborhood, but people in all neighborhoods need to have access to uh, any hospital in the city. The ambulances can cross the bridges. There, they are. This is a possibility. Um, but we also need to rely on telehealth and virtual appointments to spread access more easily across the city. Thank you, thank you. And um, you talk about shoring up H&H uh, &H, and we'll get to talk about that a little more because I have another question coming up that um, touches on that. Um, but for now, I'll move on to Mr. McGuire. Yeah, I, I, I will amplify and I know you might talk about H&H, &H, but H&H, &H, I think given what we talked about in, in, in terms of healthcare and equity is gonna be at the center of this. We already now have six of the express care centers. I would be focused on increasing that number and making in the, in the highest at risk geographies in the outer boroughs that we have these express care centers. So I would make certain that we increase that by many fold to make sure that they were there. And in addition to the urgent care centers, I would incentivize the development of primary care facilities within the boroughs so that the people in the boroughs have a primary care physician. And for those incidents that are the most acute, we should have the professional in the primary care facilities and the people would be part of a network. So where those professionals were not within the primary care facility, they could access those networks within the boroughs. And so I would make sure that the healthcare existed with the boroughs, and I would do that based on the many of the programs that are now under H and H. Especially, we're going to need programs and infrastructure to deal with the lingering the lingering impact of COVID, which has been very very little talked about. So we've talked about getting COVID, we've talked about vaccine. But what about those who recovered from COVID who have lingering conditions? We need Thank the infrastructure. You. Thank you, but I do have a follow up question for you, Mr. McGuire. Um, because um, you, you talked a bit about incentivizing, and I know before you've talked about um, different ways of zoning and financing. So can you talk a little bit more about that, um, particularly as it relates back to increasing hospital beds? Yeah, one of the things that you can do is to in, in, incentivize the development with the community involved and have this as a priority and make certain that you can adequately compensate the primary care physicians so that these become places where they wanna to work to be part of the community. And so I would make certain that in addition to developing the infrastructure that we attracted the best physicians so that the quality healthcare that all of us deserve were available locally. And I think we can create incentives to build. I think we can create incentives for doctors to, to perform and nurses and nurses assistants to want to be part of these communities and be compensated at, at the appropriate levels. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next, I will ask uh, Mr. Yang. We have such a vastly unequal healthcare system uh, in the city where you have some of the best world-class research, research institutions in the world, uh, and then you have uh, massive hospital bed shortages uh, and lower life expectancies in areas of the Bronx uh, and Brooklyn, uh, you have to try and solve for the lowest hanging fruit opportunities. Again, I reference neighborhood action centers in places like Queens, uh, where right now uh, they're, they're um, not getting the, the right kind of primary care or access to urgent services. And then I agree with Catherine that we have to make better use of the capacity we do have. Um, I would love to be able to build new hospitals in some of these healthcare deserts, uh, but in the interim, we should be utilizing more of the capacity in some of these hospital networks where they, they do have much higher levels of resources and let folks know, look, you might not have the beds in the Bronx, but we actually can cross the bridge and bring you to NYP and these other facilities. Thank you, thank you. Uh, and um, I guess my question for you to uh, follow up on that is uh, how, how would you, um, work between um, the different hospital systems because that's that that that's been a problem and in, in, in even for, for instance in terms of COVID response it's, it's very uneven in terms of which hospitals have resources and which ones don't um, and, and I guess my question to you is if you're trying to distribute that infrastructure 
and that capacity uh, more evenly. How would you get, um, for instance, public and private hospitals to um, work together, or private, public and private hospital systems to work together on that? No, the, the perfect example of this is what's going on right now with uh, vaccination, where again, uh, you have people logging into public hospitals, urgent care centers, and the private hospital networks, and the private hospital networks don't share their data either. Uh, you know, while we're in the midst of this crisis, we need to have a sense of the capacity in both public and private hospitals, uh, and then have more leadership, frankly, in being able to connect citizens to resources right now for the vaccine, uh, but also moving forward if you have another crisis to be able to see where you have capacity and where you have a need. This is the frustration that so many New Yorkers have is that we have institutions and systems that are siloed and don't talk to each other. And one of the primary missions of the next mayor has to be to get folks around a table and say, look, like we're still trying to, grow, to get ourselves out of this crisis and we cannot have you husbanding resources that are literally going to save lives applied in a neighborhood like only a mile or two away. Like this is a leadership exercise, it's an administrative barrier. It's not even really a technological barrier because these Thank systems you. have the capacity to actually share information if you actually just push them to do so. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Adams. Uh, yes, you know, I, I often, sometimes when I hear uh, Catherine speak, I feel like she's a lost twin uh, because, you know, we both just seem to get uh, how we must do things in real time. Uh, that is the failure of our city. When you look at what they do in Boston with City Score, uh, when you look at um, what uh, we're doing in, it, in this city, not only are we silos, uh, but as I state, we feed the crisis. Why aren't we using telemedicine? I attempted to get H and H to embrace telemedicine. Uh, so often uh, prior to the pandemic, they refused to do so. Now they incorporate it, and they have hundreds of thousands of people who utilize it. Uh, I didn't get to answer the immigrant question, uh, but one way of dealing with the immigrant issue is having our Im immigrants use credible messengers that speak the language and communicate so we don't use the emergency room as primary care. A way to do that <laughs> is to utilize tele telemedicine. Second, we need to build out one hospital system in real time of availability of hospital beds. And we shall leverage our power. Many of these hospitals, the privates we call them, they're using taxpayers' dollars. They get um, uh, tax breaks because they're nonprofits. Uh, we need to say it's time for you to come to the table and be part of a health, health and hospital system and participate in utilizing your buying power and your expertise. We have one um, citizenry in this city, not a Manhattan hospital system and an out of borough hospital system. They need to do more with those tax benefits they're receiving. Thank you, thank you. And uh, my apologies to you, Mr. Adams, if you didn't get to answer the health insurance question um, relating to immigrants. Um, I'd like to give you that time now. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's about communication and, uh, and that's, a, that's quite all right. I know it wasn't intentional. Um, it's, it's about communication. Uh, we, you saw during COVID and we continue to see our leaders communicate in this city as though it's an English only speaking city. All the briefings around COVID, they were in English. Uh, we didn't reach out to the local uh, various uh, papers in a different ethnicity, the Bangladeshi community, the Chinese, the Spanish speaking community. That is the problem in our city. We continue to run this city like it's an English speaking city. 40% of Brooklyn I speak a language other than English at home. We need to reach out to those credible messengers similar to what we saw during uh, the census track and how we reached out to those local community groups. Many people are afraid to walk into the hospitals because they believe ICE will be there. They're afraid to get the medical care that they need until there's an emergency. I say let's be more proactive and not reactive and we can get this done better. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so um, we're still on the question about um, equity in healthcare and addressing the outer boroughs. And I am really sorry if I miss anyone in this, um, but I believe Mr. Donovan is next. Yeah, I thought you might have uh, ceded my time to Eric, which I- No, no not at all. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's time you get your time. 
<laughs> thank you. Thank you, yeah. Cheryl. Look, every I, I would agree with a lot of what's been said about this issue around hospitals and the need for the mayor to use their leverage. We should also remem remember that we are losing more hospitals uh, even as we speak. And I've been working with Reverend Malcolm and a group of clergy to organize around stopping the closure of, of Kingsbrook. And there, so there's still many examples we need to be fighting on right now so that this disparity doesn't get worse. But we've also got to ask a bigger question here. Even if we had perfectly equal access to hospitals, we would still have hugely different health outcomes for black and brown people and others in this city. Uh, I know this because I've seen it over and over again in my work over the last 30 years in New York City neighborhoods. And what we need is a mayor who understands that every issue is an equity issue and would lead with a chief equity officer that would report directly to the mayor. I committed to that my policy as my very first policy commitment as uh, running for mayor. We need, as I said, in 15 minute neighborhoods, every neighborhood, not just to have a hospital, to have primary care, to have emergency mental health, but also have access to fresh food, to a park, to exercise with your kids. All of those are critically important. And we have to close the wealth gap because one of the real barriers to equal access to healthcare is the wealth gap. White families have 10 times more wealth than black families in this country. That has to end. It's why I proposed equity bonds that would give every kid born in New York $1,000 and depending on income up to $2,000 a year, which means you could graduate high school if you were born in poverty in New York with $50,000 to put toward building a life uh, of opportunity. Thank you, thank you. And now we're gonna move on to our next question is, which is about prioritizing equity. So this pandemic has laid bare enduring inequities that permeate almost every part of our healthcare system, preventing communities of color, immigrants, people who are LGBTQ, as well as those who have disabilities, mental illness, and substance use disorders, prevents them from accessing the healthcare that they need. Now, if elected mayor, would you consider creating a commissioner level post with the charge of promoting and ensuring equity across government agencies and policies. Uh, President Biden has done something similar through a position on his domestic policy council, but would you do this in New York City commissioner level post? And I will first ask that question of Mr. McGuire. The answer is unequivocally, if you look at the MWB, look at the procurement process here and look at the number of MBWE con uh, contracts that have been given out. 67% of the city is black and brown, less than 1% of the contracts. Maybe it's 2% of the contract. So without question, it would be a cabinet level position and I would have direct input on it, but we need to address what I've written about long before COVID and long before George Floyd about the system of systemic inequities that have beset this country for at least 400 years. And it has played out front and center in this city. So the answer is yes, I would create a cabinet level position that would go across the agencies to ensure that we had equitable distribution of the city's resources. And I would do that and I would wanna be held accountable. I wouldn't have to rely on somebody else. I wouldn't I have to rely on a diversity officer. I would be responsible for it because I am diverse and I would be that chief person. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, Mr. Yang. I would, uh, but I'd go a step further. I think we need to amend the city charter to include addressing the racial health gap as a central mission of all of our agencies, especially the DOH MH. Uh, it's unconscionable, the disparities that we're seeing. Uh, the one that pains me the most is uh, the uh, mortality rate for uh, expectant black mothers is eight times that of a, a white mother. Um, so we need to make this the central mission of many of our agencies and actually have this as the, the key benchmark. Um, it, it's just unacceptable that people are dying a decade earlier in Brownsville than Greenwich Village. It's unacceptable that black mothers are going into the hospital on what should be a joyous day, um, only to be uh, suffering tragedies at such a high rate. Uh, so to, to address these, we need to work at it every single day particularly for the, the black uh, maternal mortality, uh, I believe we should be expanding uh, provision of doulas. Uh, I believe that women 
listen to women and will empower them to make sure that healthcare providers understand. Thank you, Mr. Yang, but I will give you a chance uh, later on to talk about that um, plan a little more because um, we will have a question about that. So thank you very much. And um, Mr. Adams. Uh, you know, uh, thank you uh, so, so much. And yes, I, yes, I will immediately. Uh, but uh, really, as I stated, uh, we must go uh, further, uh, not only to identify the inequities, uh, but to prevent them from taking place in uh, in the first place. Uh, I say this over and over again, you know, as Archbishop Desmond Tutu stated, we spend a lifetime pulling people out of the river. No one goes upstream and prevent them from falling in in the first place. Healthcare is one of the places. Uh, merely to have access to a place where you could have medical care, that is not the gold standard. And that's not progressive. Uh, being progressive in my belief is when you prevent people to need the hospitals in the first place, serving healthy food in schools, making sure every place that government is providing food is healthy food. We feed our healthcare crisis, it's not sustainable. 80, 80 cents on a dollar to chronic diseases, uh, the number of people who are dealing with chronic diseases are real. That's not a sustainable system. Thank you. Mr. Donovan, oh, you've already said yes. So I guess my question, <laughs> um, if you can talk about your vision for that role. So Cheryl, let me just be clear about this because you, mm -hmm. I thought you said commissioner level. Yes. And I am concerned that a commissioner level role is not enough and okay. will get siloed so that this doesn't become a priority for every single commissioner uh, across the government. One of the things that's unique about me as a candidate is I've worked with mayors all around the country and around the world. I've seen what works and what doesn't. And in my experience, when you create a commissioner level role for equity, um, it doesn't have the effect of, as I said before, recognizing that every issue is an equity issue. Um, having been a commissioner myself in this city, I think you need that role reporting directly to the mayor not to a deputy mayor and to be in city hall. You also need to back it up with real accountability and metrics. Let me give you an example. 311 is a system that has allowed in many cases uh, people to have a more responsive government, uh, to give complaints about what's not working in the city, to get information about what is working. But we also know that black and brown people are much less likely to use 311. That's true here in New York. It's true in other places around the country. A chief equity officer sitting in City Hall uh, reporting directly to the mayor would have the purview to be able to look at an issue like that and say, how do we fix 311 to make sure that every New Yorker, regardless of what they look like, what language they speak, um, has the ability to make their voice heard Thank and you. to ensure that government is accountable. Wonderful. Thank you. And Ms. Garcia. Yes, and I, but I will agree with Sean on this. It's not a commissioner level. You want someone that the commissioners report to uh, who can be authoritative and work across all agencies. So that is part of what the mayor holds them accountable for. Um, I have seen this done in the past. I've worked across agencies. I know that being authorized by the mayor is critically important uh, for it to actually occur. So absolutely. Thank you. Uh, this next question is concerning New York Health and Hospitals. New York City's public health and hospital system serves hundreds of thousands of low-income uninsured patients annually. And policy experts and advocates have long argued that it is underfunded by state lawmakers that control the allocation of billions of dollars of indigent care pool and Medicaid. Just this past week, the governor's budget proposes to slash funding for New York City's public hospitals by another $139 million. Mayors typically have been unable to turn this situation around. What would you do to improve the financial stability of New York health and hospitals? And I do ask that you, know, that you talk about the hospital system uh, in your answer. So the next person will be Mr. McGuire. You know, this is, this is, again, as I said from the outset, essential to this city. 
the New York Health and Hospitals has got an $8 billion budget. It's running at a $2.3 billion deficit. It serves a million people with five to six million visits per year. Today, that system needs to get much more funding than what it has, because if it doesn't, we're gonna be in a worse state of disrepair than we currently are. So I would go make the appeal to the federal government and to the state government, and I would make the case as to how important this system is and how vital it is to not only the survival of New York, but to but to the future of New York. And that would be one of the major priorities that I would set out from day one. We have to have a functioning, well-functioning health and hospitals corporation that today is at a deficit. Federal government gave $1.2 billion or so in COVID to help out with COVID relief. I think the ask was much larger than that. And so when we face a, a reduction in that budget, it's gonna have a pretty material negative impact on all of us, especially black and brown communities. And so I would make the appeal and I would appeal to all resources, federal, state and local to make sure that we could address what is a maybe even a structural deficit by 2023. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Mr. Yang. Ray is 100 percent correct uh, that we need to get the resources from the state and the federal government and the budget that you're describing. Um, envisions a multi-billion dollar deficit at the state level and Governor Cuomo is going to the feds and saying, look, we need $15 billion to fill this budgetary hole. And if we get that $15 billion of the roughly $350 billion that I think was in, envisioned in this last um, uh, recovery act that um, President Biden has proposed, then I believe that the, uh, the money that we were describing hopefully will not be taken out of the New York City Health and Hospitals budget. It's one reason why we should all be celebrating the fact that Chuck Schumer is the new majority leader, that we have a real chance for real aid and real relief out of the federal government, uh, because the stark truth is that in this case, that's where the resources are most likely to come from. That's what Governor Cuomo is fighting for out of Albany, and the mayor needs to be Governor Cuomo's partner in saying that New York has been sending over $25 billion a year more to the federal government than it's been receiving for years. There is no national recovery without a New York recovery. That includes the state, that includes the city, and that includes the $139 million plus that we need for the New York City Health and Hospitals. And I agree that's not enough. We should be growing this and not contracting. Thank you, thank you. Um, I do have a follow-up um, because it's very important for um, the mayor to work with um, the governor, uh, as well as the federal government. And can you talk a little bit about how you would, your relationship with the governor and um, the federal government be more effective in doing this? The interests of the city and the interests of the state are 100% aligned in terms of getting appropriate levels of federal aid. The fact is the city is the majority of the economy uh, of the state. And the fact that the governor and the mayor have not been on the same page has been very, very negative for the, the folks who live right here in the city. We've all seen it, we've all felt it. I aim to be a friend and ally and sidekick if necessary to the governor to make this case to the feds. Uh, I'm friends with his brother from CNN. I'm very easy to get along with. Uh, like I'm all about just trying to get stuff done for New York City. And I will give the governor all the credit in the world. Like I'll just be behind him clapping as we get the aid necessary for the city and state. Like Sean, I also do have a lot of friends in DC. Um, so I'm with Sean on that score. Uh, he's got their numbers, I've got their numbers. We're gonna make sure that we get what we deserve. Can I say I know the brother, the, the, the brother and, the, and the governor. So, you know, that's- Thank you. Let's all call them. Like everyone here, let's all freak Everybody you. got their number. <laughs> on the phone and freaking badger the heck out of me. Let's <laughs> do a Zoom call, all of us. <laughs> all right, folks, I want to go back in order, but thank you. Um, Mr. Adams, you're next. You, you know, I, I'm going to talk about this uh, often during this campaign. Uh, think about this for a moment. We spend 18% of our GDP on uh, health care. Um, almost 11,000 uh, per Americans, 30 million Americans are diabetic, 84 uh, million are pre-diabetic, 80 cents on a dollar uh, goes to uh, chronic diseases inside our healthcare system. This is not sustainable, folks. 
And if our conversation is merely uh, how do we continue to pour money into a healthcare system that's not sustainable, this is the wrong road in the wrong direction, how I will help health and hospital, I would do what I did at Bellevue Hospital, first of its kind in America, lifestyle medicine, 750 people signed up into the program, uh, 250 people are in the program, 750 on the waiting list, reversing chronic diseases. It's time to move away from just treating symptoms and reverse chronic diseases through the pre-existing, some of the pre-existing conditions we see. This is not sustainable. Thank you, thank you. Uh, and Mr. Donovan. Thanks, Cheryl. Uh, I, I wanna agree with uh, my colleagues here that we absolutely need more help from Washington and from the state. Uh, with all due respect to their Rolodexes, I think there's no one in this race who actually has worked side by side with these folks. Xavier Becerra, the incoming Health and Human Services Secretary, is somebody I've worked with side by side. Uh, almost every senior leader in the government is not just a colleague, but a friend who I have worked in the trenches with uh, on these issues. And so we do need more and we need a mayor who you trust can actually get the help that we deserve. But that is not enough. I wanna agree with Eric too, that we have to reimagine the way we deliver healthcare. The fundamental problem for the Health and Hospitals Corporation is two things. It is not effectively run as a healthcare system. I've worked with Mitch Katz, uh, the new director. I think he's taking it in the right direction. I worked with him when he led healthcare for LA County, uh, particularly on homelessness. We can implement delivery system reform like we pioneered in the Affordable Care Act. We can bring down the cost of prescription drugs. The mayor has not used powers that he has to do that. But we also have to remember that the fundamental problem is the Health and Hospitals Corporation is the only healthcare system that is really taking our poorest patients, that is really taking those who are uninsured. We have to demand that the private hospitals do more. We talked earlier about the leverage the mayor has. We have to use that leverage to ensure they're sharing uh, that, uh, that responsibility as well. Thank we you. also know that there are very good primary care providers um, that are culturally appropriate in neighborhoods across this city. They speak uh, the hundreds of languages that New Yorkers speak. They deliver care in ways that the communities are comfortable with and they understand. We have to be investing more in those systems. Thank the you, quality is good there. We can do more. And with my uh, public option that I'm proposing for New York City, we would be able to cover that care rather than having it end up in our emergency rooms at H&H. &H. Thank you, thank you. Um, Ms. Garcia. Thank you. I do think that we need to be advocating strongly at the federal level, but also demanding at the state level that we get our fair share of the funds that are in the charitable pot that all insurance companies pay into because H&H &H is the one hospitals of last resort. Uh, but we also need to ensure that we are moving as many of the folks who use the emergency room in an H&H &H hospital into a primary care relationship, which we know over the long term will make them healthier. Uh, but at the end of the day, the city will have to support H&H &H because we cannot allow that system to fail. We also should be thinking about doing very creative things like the physical plant, using some of that physical plant for other, other things, uh, selling the air rights, we need to drive money into this system without losing our hospital beds. So I believe that that is how we're going to have to think creatively about keeping it financed and keeping it going, but we can't afford to lose it. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to move on to our next question. And this one is about protecting patients from medical bills that they can't afford. 60% of New York City residents say they faced a health care affordability burden in the prior year. And over 6,000 New York City residents have been sued by New York's nonprofit charitable hospitals for medical bills, often at a 9% commercial interest rate. Hospital lawyers usually win these cases on default, and most patients do not appear in court and none have lawyers. And many hospitals, on the other hand, while they've paused this practice during the pandemic, our question is, what would you do as mayor to protect patients and prevent nonprofit hospitals from filing these lawsuits and other unfair and discriminatory hospital practices beyond the pandemic? 
I will first ask this of Mr. Yang. This is such an important question. If you look around the country, uh, healthcare costs are the number one source of bankruptcy, and it's worse here in New York because you have a set of pricing that lacks transparency or rationality. You have procedures that are 40 or 50 percent more expensive, like 20 blocks north of another hospital performing the same procedure. Uh, and then you know who ends up paying for it? The public in ways big and small. Um, so I agree with Eric that we need to bring these hospitals to the table and not let the fact that they're nonprofits, let them blanket themselves as completely immune from accountability, from price gouging, from suing uh, indigent patients. Because the fact is, if you do lawyer up and fight these charges, they cut the charges very quickly. There's like no true cost to a lot of these procedures. Like they'll end up billing you, you know, uh, like eighty thousand dollars for something, and then if you lawyer up, like all of a sudden the eighty thousand comes down to, to twenty thousand very very quickly. Um, so we need to bring them to the table and also say, look, you have this tax exemption that is worth hundreds of millions of dollars a year. You're benefiting from fire and police and other services, and you are gouging the public in many many ways. You need to actually publish your rates transparently so we can compare them across systems, that alone would be a game changer because their rates make no sense. They know it. And as soon as it's exposed to the light of day and the public realizes how much we're paying, we can change it. It's Thank not you. the indigent that are getting screwed. It's the public. Thank you very much. Mr. Adams. Uh, well said. I could not have agreed uh, with uh, Andrew Moore. Uh, transparency is the key. Uh, when you do an examination, and I have to take my hat off to 32BJ and what they did with Presbyterian Hospital, uh, you, here you have uh, our unions going in to negotiate for fair wages just to have uh, the some of the private charging exorbitant fees uh, for minor procedures or procedures that when you go to a health and hospital, they're substantially uh, less. Uh, we need real transparency, and then we need the state to step step in and come up with clear guidelines on the course of services. Uh, this way, we will, we will compel people to bring down the cost of these procedures, transparency on how much it costs, but also we will help people to go to our health and hospital uh, facilities as well. We can't continue to allow this free-for-all the wild, wild west of medicine and anything goes and no one knows what we're being paid, what we're being charged or paid for. I agree 100% with Andrew. Thank you, Mr. Adams and Mr. Donovan. So I want to agree with Andrew and Eric that we need more, uh, more transparency. And look, the mayor has authority to be able to hold folks accountable. The mayor can work effectively with Titch James and other law enforcement officials around the state to do that. We also have to recognize a couple other things, though. One is that this is happening in part because we don't. There are too many people who don't have insurance; they don't have coverage, and because the Trump administration has eroded the standards for what a health plan plan must cover, and allowed uh, plans that are far too expensive in terms of minimal coverage, huge copays, and other things. So those are changes that need to happen. Uh, right away. The last thing I would say, though, too, is we need to make sure that we're providing the legal assistance and counseling that folks need when they are victimized. I've seen this over and over again in the housing crisis. One of the most important things we did to protect New Yorkers' homes was to put money into housing counseling and legal aid to make sure that folks are protected. We need to do a similar thing for New Yorkers across every part of their lives. Healthcare can, as Andrew said, devastate people's lives. It causes bankruptcies all the time. A small investment in legal services can save a family's life, literally, and also protect their wealth Thank for you. their children. Thank you very much. And Ms. Garcia. Thank you. Uh, I do believe that for many of us, when we think about the bills from health insurance for healthcare, it's almost like when you go to the top, the car dealership and you're not sure whether or not is it the sticker price or is it the discounted price or is it some other price that you might be paying. Uh, and so transparency and getting all of the hospitals, 
the voluntary hospitals to the table is critical so that we know what's on the menu um, and we know what it is compared to health to H and H. But the other piece that I think we can do from a regulatory standpoint, and this is just from personal experience. So I had very good health insurance. Many years ago, I went in and had a baby. Uh, my doctor was in the plan. The hospital was in the plan. The anesthesiologist was not in the plan, but I didn't pick the anesthesiologist. I just needed one. That's the one that was on call at the time. And so suddenly as a very, very young mother, I had an enormous, well, I thought it was an enormous bill. It wasn't in the tens of thousands. I think it was like 3000, but it was an enormous bill for me. Uh, and we need to ensure that people don't walk out of a hospital thinking they have good insurance and then surprise bills as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so we are going to move on to the next question. Oh, wait, my apologies, Mr. McGuire. Yeah, I was just waiting to see. <laughs> I was gonna forget you, I'm so sorry if I ever do. Thank you. Um, what would I do here? I, first of all, I think we need to acknowledge that there are many instances of the private institutions working with the public institutions, working with the labor to make certain that there is support across the system. The inequities that we're describing are inequities that exist in the private sector as well as the public sector. So we need to have a uniform approach to how we're gonna deal with these inequities. And so what I would do when it gets to going forward to make certain that I authored and led a uniform approach and get the private sector and the public sector together as we go as we as we talk about pricing. And the other thing that we need to do is to think about the kinds of of um, system that we can put in place across the system to make certain that that the, that there's equity and to make certain that the 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 things that are taking place now with the patients that, that gets cured. And that's across the system. And I would invest. And also, when it comes to arbitration, I would access the legal community. Legal Aid is one where I've been honored for the work and my contribution to, to um, efforts like this. I would make certain that we set up legal community and ask them to do pro bono work to set in and arbitrate between many of these existing cases and the healthcare system. We have the relationships where that can occur. And I'm quite confident that we can get them involved and help give, as it's been said here, as you stated, when the lawyers are involved, the, 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 the litigation goes away. So let's get the lawyers involved, let's support legal aid, and let some of the private practitioners who can come in and help arbitrate many of the outstanding settlements. Thank you, thank you. So this next question um, is about addressing the racial gap in maternal deaths, which was uh, mentioned before. Um, but I'll set the stage. Between 2011 and 2015, black women accounted for 54% of pregnancy-related deaths, but only 20% of births. Meanwhile, white women accounted for 11% of pregnancy-related related deaths, but 33% of births. Let me do that again, because that was a little garbled. Black women, 54% of pregnancy-related deaths, but only 20% of births. Meanwhile, white women accounting for 11% of pregnancy-related deaths, but 33% of births. So what would you do as mayor to address the maternal mortality crisis experienced by black and brown women in New York City? And I will first ask this question of Mr. Adams. Uh, the, the first thing is to identify it as a crisis. Uh, I stated this over and over again, America's inability to identify crises. When opio when uh, crack cocaine was in our communities was an issue, opioid went to the suburbs and became a crisis. When gun violence was in our communities, uh, it was an issue. When AK-47 hits the suburbs, it became a crisis. We're seeing the same thing with maternal mor morbidity. It is not, hasn't even been properly defined as a crisis. We're saying that black lives don't matter, not only with Floyd, but in our hospital rooms every day. Identify this crisis and give the resources that's needed to reverse these numbers. But second, which is very important, is the number of cesarean. Every time that baby fails to go through a mother's birth canal and not properly inoculated with her microbiomes, we are actually jeopardizing the well-being of that of that mother and that child. And so we need to refocus how do we treat 
black mothers and black babies to say their lives matter. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, next, uh, Mr. Donovan. Thank you, Cheryl. This is an issue where we need healthcare equally available in every community across this city. That's why as part of my 15 minute neighborhood proposal that would drive all of my planning for the city, we would prioritize prenatal care available in local communities across the city, but we have to do a lot more. We have to understand that in our uh, shelter system, in our justice system, in our public schools, we need to have that same prenatal care available equitably. And we need to make sure that we, we just talked about our health and hospitals corporation, that every single visit, prenatal visit, includes a uh, connection to a social worker who can understand uh, social determinants of health that may lead to higher risk, and to make sure that we are providing greater programming uh, at h, h I would also ensure, I mentioned earlier, the importance of connecting every uh, city agency together. One of the things I learned as housing commissioner, I worked closely with the health department. Every time we did a visit for a potential lead paint in an apartment, we were armed with materials that were available on prenatal care, and we paired with a health, uh, health worker. We ought to be doing that with every time a, uh, a city worker touches uh, a potential um, uh, recent uh, birth to come in the, in, the, in the coming months to ensure that we're delivering the kind of information and services. Finally, we need to significantly expand access to midwives and doulas. My own two boys were delivered uh, by a midwife. We still keep in touch. It was a remarkable experience. Why shouldn't every New Yorker, regardless of income or race, have the ability to have that experience when their child is born. Thank you, um, Mr. Donovan. Uh, Ms. Garcia, I'm going to go to you next. I'm going to apologize in advance. I'm going to stop my camera for a second to fix some lighting, um, but uh, I just wanted to let you know that so you wouldn't wonder why. So that you haven't disappeared. Right. <laughs> but please. But I, I, I'll go on. Yes. <laughs> We don't, we don't waste anyone's time. This is an absolute crisis. And we know that prenatal care is absolutely critical to the health of the mother and, and the child. And there are a couple of things about when you are you know, very pregnant and you're getting towards the end of that pregnancy is one, can you take the time off from work if it is stressful for you to be able to, uh, if you're putting too much pressure on your body? that you're getting screened to make sure you're not getting pro close to preeclampsia uh, as you get to those last few weeks of birth. And then we absolutely need to have doulas in the birthing room with mothers. It is incredibly hard to advocate for yourself in the middle of delivery. And having someone there who can do that for you that is trusted, that is a member of your community uh, is very important so that you get the best care and your child gets the best care. And I know that this is a different model than we have put in place before, but we need to try different things when we are confronted with a crisis of this magnitude. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. McGuire. Yes, listen, this is a crisis. We just don't know the magnitude of the crisis. Uh, maternal, maternal morbidity, especially mortality amongst black women is 12 times more from pregnancy related complications than it is any other of the demographics. And so what I would do is to create a, a committee that focus on this. The other thing that is not often spoken about is the unconscious bias that exists amongst many of our healthcare professionals when it comes to black women and their births. And so I would one, wanna go through with this committee to identify the data, to get the data that is available to us that has yet to been com compiled take a look at the causes behind this. I would also look at what we can do to address the unconscious biases that exist in, in many of these facilities and many of these incidents. And this would be the highest priority because it is at a crisis, especially in black and brown communities and something that needs to be addressed, which up to this point has only been talked about and there's very little that's been done. 
I held a gathering that was uh, that was hosted by me and Alexis McGill Johnson of Planned Parenthood, where this was the central theme. And out of that came ideas about how we're going to address it. And this has to have the highest level of prioritization, especially in communities of color. Thank you, Mr. McGuire. And Mr. Yang, you mentioned this before, so please. Um, yeah, the, uh, Catherine's right about stress levels and the amount that you work uh, while you're pregnant. Uh, to me, I'd like to reflect on, um, well, I, I, I met with this black mother um, who almost bled out uh, while giving birth and she was very highly educated. I think the darkest thing about this statistic is that it's independent of the education level uh, of, of the mother. Um, and I wanna trace back the way that we gave birth. I mean, not that I was around for this, but like women helped women give birth for eons, for generations. And then eventually it transitioned into our hospital system in part because there was money to be made. And the reality is that too many healthcare providers do not listen to black women. Uh, they don't listen to women very often and they don't listen to black women in particular. So you need a doula who can help champion what that woman is going through. You need more black healthcare providers who are more likely to actually heed the words of, of black women. And that to me is the crucial opportunity to actually turn this around. It is a crisis, it's despicable, it's deplorable. It's, a, it's the intersection of racism and, and misogyny in the clearest way. Uh, and it's a vital moral, moral obligation for us to address it very powerfully. Thank you, thank you very much. So um, with that, um, we are right on time uh, to wrap and everyone has uh, 30 seconds for closing remarks. And um, so uh, I believe I should start with Mr. Donovan. Thank you, Cheryl. You sure about that? You sounded a little unsure. <laughs> Well, well, we'd love you to do You're it. You're not anyway. skipping over Eric yeah. again, are you? <laughs> <laughs> and I have 10 candidates. <laughs> You've been heroic tonight. <laughs> My apologies. Yes. No, 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 no. I'm just, uh, just ribbing you. Thank you. Uh, and thank you all for joining tonight. You've heard a bit about my experience leading through crisis, but I'm a public servant because I grew up in a different time of crisis in this city. I saw homelessness exploding around me. I saw neighborhoods of color like the South Bronx, Central Brooklyn, and so many others crumbling and literally burning to the ground. And it lit a fire in me to go to work on behalf of this city I love. I was a volunteer in a homeless shelter in college. When I finished school, I came back and started working for a nonprofit in those very neighborhoods I'd seen burning as a child. And that began a 30 year career on the front lines of housing and homelessness, of economic and racial justice. And through all of that work, I've learned that when a crisis hits, it always falls on those who are most vulnerable before the crisis. Thank you. That's why I was outraged, but not surprised that COVID disproportionately devastated communities of color. But it also reminds me of something that President Obama used to say, never let a crisis go to waste. In this moment, when we repair and rebuild this city, we must reimagine it as a city that works for everyone. Thank Together, you. Together, we can do that. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Garcia. Thank you so much for having me. I think this is an incredibly, perhaps the most important conversation around health and equity coming out of the pandemic so we don't repeat the same mistakes that we made going into this pandemic. We need to strengthen our healthcare system and ensure that communities of color have a spectrum of care that is really starts at birth and takes care of them through their life, but also does the pillars of ensuring safe housing, safe parks, healthy food, because otherwise it's very hard to maintain your health going forward. I'm running for mayor because I have been doing the job for you, whether or not that was delivering your water, delivering food during COVID or picking up your garbage. I know how to deliver services to New York City residents effectively. And so I hope that you will follow and support the campaign and look up other policies at uh, www.kgfornyc.com. Thank you. Mr. McGuire. Thank you. I 
Listen, I grew up on the other side of the tracks. I come from the bottom. My single mother raised me and my two brothers. She was a social worker. So I know what it's like not to have. I know what the threat of not having health care. And I know that based on her sacrifices and her prayers that I've gotten to a position where not only the lived experiences, which is the foundation that she gave me, but what I've been able to accomplish because of her sacrifices, my education, and the investments that I've made in communities, especially communities of color and in healthcare. With my lived experiences and what I've been able to accomplish and lead through crisis and manage through crisis and the relationships that I can bring to bear, no one has those three qualities at the same time. Lived experience, experience leading and managing and relationships. And yes, the governor, the governor's brother, the, the senators and the people in Washington, some of whom I introduced to New York. So we have relationships, we have the lived experiences and we know how to get this done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Yang. Thank you for this opportunity. This has been a terrible time uh, for so many New Yorkers, over 26,000 lives lost, uh, over 700,000 jobs that we've yet to, to recover. Uh, it's been a disastrous time for our mental health. We're gonna to need to do a number of things to get out of this crisis. I'm running for mayor because I believe I can accelerate our recovery, but also make us a more equitable and just city. And I want to amend the city charter to make addressing the racial health inequities key to the mission of every city agency. I believe that's one of the, the opportunities in front of us. And I'd love to work with you all to make that happen. Thank you very much. And Mr. Adams. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, our city is dysfunctional. Uh, we create our crises. Uh, one agency creates the crises, another agency responds to the crises that's created. Department of Health and Mental Hygiene fights childhood obesity, asthma, Yet every day we feed our children 960,000 meals in the Department of Education, and those meals cause childhood obesity, childhood diabetes, and asthma. We're going to stop that dysfunctionality. You know my story, type two diabetes, lost my sight, permanent nerve damage. They told me I was going to be blind in a year. I was going to lose some fingers and toes. I changed my lifestyle. I have my sight, nerve damage is gone. My 82 year old mother followed me. She's off her insulin after seven years. We have to stop feeding our healthcare crisis and stop being dysfunctional as a city, as mayor. I'm going to accomplish that. Thank you so much. And thank you all. With that, um, we are now out of time. I do want to thank our candidates for sharing your plans to address health equity, if elected. Over the course of the last several hours, we've heard from Eric Adams, Sean Donovan, Catherine Garcia, Garcia, Carlos Menchaca, Diane Morales, Scott Stringer, Lori Sutton, Maya Wiley, Ray McGuire, and Andrew Yang. I want to um, extend thanks to David Jones, who is the president and CEO of Community Services Society, as well as his team, who's been behind this production. Um, they have been wonderful to work with. I also want to thank um, uh, Theo Oshiro of Make the Road New York, and Afia Atamensa of Community Voices Heard. Uh, as well, um, thank you to the host organizations, uh, Community Service Society, Community Voices Heard, and Make the Road New York. And thank you so much to City and State New York for partnering on this event. I am Cheryl Huggins Salomon of the NYU McSilver Institute. Good night. Thank you. Thank you, Cheryl. Thank you, Big elbow bump to all of you. Good to see you. Amera.com. <laughs>